We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Mantry, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And uh, yeah, should I... Yeah, I guess a little bit of bad news. Uh, the first members of my family have have contracted COVID. Uh, my, oh my God, my niece and my sister, around. My niece and my sister, they caught it. Uh, so... Everybody's doing okay. Um, in fact, the reason my sister ended up getting it is because uh, my niece's symptoms were so mild she didn't think that she had it. She thought it was, you know, right. just just picked up a cold from school because really she was feeling under the weather, but really nothing bad at all. But then, uh, but then my sister started feeling bad, so uh, she got herself a test, and she's like, "Uh oh." <laughs> so uh -oh. that yeah. probably means that uh, brother-in-law and nephew will be getting it shortly because they're. They don't have a, a gigantic place, and they definitely have been not quarantining just from my niece. I, I don't so. know how my kids didn't end up getting it. I still don't understand that. Right. Like, how did they not get it? My youngest son in particular, you know, we were, I think I've already told this story, but that we were quarantining for my wife, or my wife was quarantining from us, mm -hmm. and when she was, you know, when she we were wearing N95 masks in the house mm -hmm. sometimes, or whenever I, we thought she was going to be nearby. Um uh, and uh, I would put my mask down, and then yes. I would find it on his face. Right. <laughs> Not that long later. And then I came down with it, and he's like, <laughs> I don't know how he didn't get it. I have no idea how well, he didn't get it, but he did. Everybody's fully vaccinated. Uh, like I say, nobody's doing too poorly, but my, my sister's symptoms are, I mean, they're they're not bad bad but they're not nothing <laughs> she's got, right. got a fever got a cough got a headache so it's uh, you know yeah. de definitely knows that she's ill so yeah i really i our family got extremely lucky right. my family got extremely lucky. my wife was just and i were just you know didn't even register a fever really yeah. it was 100 and less than 100 and point a hundred point four which is what anything above 100.4 is considered a fever sure. anything below that is just like normal variation so i think i i only cracked 99 mm -hmm. once <laughs> mm -hmm. and i did have a headache but my, and my throat was sore yep. but, and i was tired yep. but i mean that was for like 36 hours and then it was just me watching tv <laughs> so. you know and, and working for the most part but uh yeah, well that's... fingers so are crossed I'm, I'm sorry to hear that rob i hope everybody feels well yeah yeah me too yeah so uh i mean we haven't really had contact for a while so don't think there's really any risk but uh yeah I'll be monitoring myself. My parents will be monitoring themselves. But uh, there we go. Mm. Hopefully it all just goes by without much of an event. That's the best we can hope for. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to talk oh, about that's... what we watched. That's sure. uh, what we're going to do. All right. I watched The Last Duel. That is uh, Ridley Scott and starring Matt Damon and uh, what's his name? I heard uh, that was kind of crap. Was that crap? Was it crap? Oh uh, well, I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, jo Jody Comer and uh, uh, Adam Driver. Just forgetting his name for a moment there. You Adam watched something Driver. with Adam Driver as well. Uh, I did. So yeah, well, okay, interesting. Um, <laughs> I can I can see how various groups of people would criticize this movie and not enjoy it because I mean it's not it's not subtle. <laughs> it's it's not uh, it's not subtle in its messaging. Uh, literally. Like lifting things that modern day politicians have said, but putting them into the mouths of 1380s uh, clergy, more or less, um, and 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 royalty, just to uh, starkly point out how <laughs> things that are being said today have not changed from the 14th century. <laughs> right. How certain people have absolutely no idea how reproduction works, apparently, <laughs> and and still to this day. So, uh, yeah, I can see how some people uh, uh, either felt attacked or felt that it was just uh, too blatant. Uh, you know, like like I say, no subtlety to it whatsoever. Um, I thought it was, you know interesting storytelling it's a very rashomon type of thing where you're seeing uh you know two or three events uh as told by two or three different characters you know so you're getting the different viewpoints and having the same scene played over multiple times but you know what is said is slightly different or who says what or when or in what tone is uh, is interpreted differently by the uh by the different characters so that's the storytelling device um 
I mean, my 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 biggest reason for for not liking it that much is okay. It's set in France. And so you have a choice, right? If you're going to be a director, yes. a storyteller, what you're going to do with a story set in France, it, you know, uh, by Ridley Scott, so so meant for English-speaking audience. Uh, so you could have actors just speak French and subtitle everything. Uh, that would be fine. You could have everybody just speak English, and that is fine. We'll get over it. We know it's set in France, but everybody is speaking English, uh, which is what they chose to do. But then how do you have everybody speak English? Do you have them all speak in French accents? Do you do what is very often done and have everybody speak in British accents, even though they're supposed to be French? Or what I would actually usually prefer is just hire the best actors and have them speak however they speak, you know, unless yeah, yeah, they're yeah. really good at accents. Just have them speak the way they speak. We'll get past it, you know, if different people have different accents, but we understand we all nobody speaking French and it's set in France. Let just do it that way. I'd be fine just with that. Just do the hunt for Red October thing. Right, right, right. So the, those of you who haven't seen that movie, I don't. First of all, see that movie. Mm -hmm. It's excellent. But uh, Sean Connery is in it. He's playing a Russian, I don't know, submarine commander or whatever. And he's they they have him say a couple lines in Russian and then they zoom in on yep. him as he's saying them, and then. Then they zoom onto his mouth, basically, I think if I remember correctly. And then he starts speaking in his no normish brogue, whatever that is, whatever his accent <laughs> Scottish. is, Scottish or whatever. Yeah. And then they zoom back out and like, that's it. That's right. That was the, we are, tra this is now being translated for we you. We understand and, and that it, in real life, he would have been speaking Russian, but it's just going right. to be the way that he speaks. And that's fine. We get past it. Well, they opted for everybody speaks with a British accent, except that it's Matt Damon and Ben Affleck in two of the main roles, and they cannot do British accents. <laughs> and, it, accents are so hard, and some people are really good at it, but right. they're so hard. And I mean, like, and, Matt Damon tried to do the thing where it's like, I know I can't do a British accent, so I'll just do a little bit, like just a tiny bit. I'll mostly sound like Matt Damon, but just put a little bit of, you know, British inflection on it, and like, that does not sound good, and then... Ben Affleck, uh, wow, that, wow. <laughs> I mean, he's he's playing a pretty despicable character from all three points of view, but still, it just it, wow. I I don't know why that was that was the choice of person to depict that role in that manner of speaking. So to me, that was kind of the weakest part of the movie. Is just like, <laughs> like I would rather just have it all be subtitled to be to be honest than 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 what they chose to do, or like I say, just have everybody speak the way they speak. That would be fine. Yeah. Uh, Adam Driver was very very good. I'm glad there's an actor like him who is willing to just come across as horrible <laughs> like he's willing to do that he doesn't have the ego where he's like oh i always have to look good in every scene have a redeeming quality or yeah something, he's right? like no i i can be awful even in my own version of the story i can be awful <laughs> and, and so i'm i i liked his performance as everybody has has said jody comer uh is really really good in it so so she's sort of the reason to watch the movie if it's anything so yeah, I'm I'm a uh, thumbs in the middle <laughs> for me. I can't really I, I I it's it's not something to avoid in my opinion, but uh but uh, it's certainly not a, a giant thumbs up. Uh I was watching it on streaming so I wasn't seeing it on disc in its best version, but it still came across very well in streaming. Mm. Uh it is shot very well. I mean, it's Ridley Scott. He knows how to shoot a movie, so it is very well shot. Uh the editing is stylistic for sure. They purposely cut scenes off abruptly and drop you into the next scene without any context or transition. Um, the first time it does that is very weird because there's a shot at the end of the first transition that looks like it's leading somewhere and then it immediately smashes to something that doesn't make any sense in that context. Mm. So, uh, But I think that might have been intentional as if to say, okay, this is what we're doing with our editing and get used to it. <laughs> like this this is the way it's going to be. Like, you know how Memento did that. We're just threw you right. into there and basically the first three scenes are super confusing, but then it's, it's sort of a blueprint of how this is going to go. So I, I, I just hate movies like that for my <laughs> wife, for my wife's right, reason. Right, I'm right, like, right. I have to like tell her i'm like listen you just have to suffer through the first yep. couple of scenes yep. and then it'll all start to coalesce and make sense right. uh but she's she really she really can't do that not <laughs> so well so that's that's you know. the last duel um yeah i i liked it more than disliked it but i can certainly see there being criticism of it not just from content but in various technical aspects as well. And like I say, the, the choice of how everybody spoke was, was the weakest part for me. Yeah. So I rewatched the first episode of Miss Marvel mm -hmm. and then, of course, watched the second episode mm -hmm. and then, of course, watched 
is it the fifth episode of Obi Wan that's out now? That, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the time uh, you're hearing this, all six It'll episodes be... will be out. But at the time we're recording, again, it. The, much like Moon Knight, I'm at the end of the fifth episode, mm-hmm. and I'm like, "How are they going to wrap There's this too up much. in one episode? <laughs> There's, too much left. There's too much left going on." <laughs> uh, I want this to be so much longer than it mm. is. Obi, okay, I, I know I'm off already off track here, but I want Obi Wan to be so much longer. Well, it does make you see... wonder if it's going to end in a place that obviously sets up a series two, because that well, that's a they already they already said at least i've read someplace that the series two has already been mm. greenlit but uh i don't really know i i feel like the arc of obi-wan you know seemingly disconnected from the force at the beginning uh or not living the jedi life and then coming back to it mm-hmm. could be longer could mm. have more of a you know a training montage if you will but over multiple episodes uh it doesn't seem to be how they're doing it right now but i very much am liking obi-wan uh miss marvel we watched the first episode which i definitely saw what you were saying about she seems to be mumbling or whatever oh, okay. uh, yeah. yeah i i i paid a little bit more attention to that and there were def you could see the scenes that they were using for like the trailers and it's she's much easier to understand mm. in those scenes than the other ones uh than some of the other ones but uh second episode i really quite enjoyed there's mm-hmm. a you know, the end of it was a little bit different than I expected. And I was, uh, you know, you could kind of see, I, I do like this whole, you know, the the parallels to Spider-Man are just sure. they're <laughs> so obvious, but they're also very enjoyable. So I, I, I'm i What do you think that. about the stark difference in powers? Because I... That doesn't bother it me. It doesn't bother me. That doesn't bother I, me I, like, not at all. I don't feel like it should bother me because it's not like I was some gigantic Ms. Marvel comic book fan. I, I haven't I read a single I do want her to say one. embiggen, though. If she doesn't say embiggen, <laughs> I, I feel like I'm <laughs> I'm waiting for the embiggen moment. I just... But other than that... The... the uh, Is it spoilers? Uh, uh, whatever. She's, no, you can see you can see her you can Yeah, see her she's projecting light things. And like we've said, it's a little bit Green Lantern-ish. So, you know, things, yeah. things that she sort of envisions appear. Um, and it's like... The, the whole sort of action sequence of the second episode there, um, I was like, yeah, like it's fine, but it just, it didn't, it wasn't anything that particularly made me associate it to Ms. Marvel. Like Ms. Marvel, her powers go along with the way that she is developing as a person, as a teenager. What's happening to her physically in the comic books yeah. is metaphorical for what's happening to her personally and emotionally. And I'm like, this just like throwing out platforms a light i'm like eh, it doesn't you know like it's well, fine okay. as a power but it doesn't it doesn't track to me in any emotional way i, I that was so I, I was can, a little disappointed with that so i can understand what you're saying mm-hmm. there i do i do think that the track they're taking with connecting her more closely to captain marvel mm-hmm. and captain marvel has you know the more energy based powers sure. and then they're going to end up in a movie together you know very soon here i guess yeah uh to me, that's fine. I there's two powers in comics that I loathe, and one of them is the stretchy one because I think okay. it's stupid and dumb <laughs> and lame. I've always thought that. I've never thought that was a cool power. Mister Fantastic's real power is that he's smart, and every and the stretchy part is just dumb. Okay, <laughs> and then the hair thing, right? Of uh, Medusa, okay. like the prehensile hair. I've which always thought those powers immediately were just... took away from her in the Inhuman series. I know. Well, oh, they're like, was... we can't pay for we the, can't pay for this. The CGI. only thing worse than than your dislike of a character with the hair powers is immediately taking their hair powers. Yeah, getting away. her sh- get, getting her shaved immediately. <laughs> oh, was, uh, yeah, so those are the two powers I really hate. So, and Ms. Marvel, you know, this to me is fine. I mean, it, there, there's it, yeah. I, I've got no problems, and they fine. can still do a metaphor. They can still turn this into yeah. a metaphor. Yeah, well, I for... like the part where it like showed up on her nose for no reason, like that. That to yeah. me was the the closest that you were getting to. So yeah. going... I just kind of wish that I'm fine with it being light projection. I just I, I sort of wish it had been that it has to remain attached to an appendage that it couldn't just be a free floating platform because that's something she never did in the comics. She never like yeah. took a piece off herself and made a platform out of it. So. <laughs> She's well, not plastic. So. We'll see what they end up doing. We'll see with what it, it goes. But uh, yeah, so far I'm liking that. I, I, my wife really likes it. Uh, you know, so th- it's that's that's a big plus yeah. for me. Great. <laughs> she likes it. I did watch a couple of things this weekend. None of them are new. So if you're looking for new movies, I, I'm not it. I left the room while my wife and youngest son were choosing what to watch, and I came back in, and they had started. 
the Tom Hanks movie Turner and Hooch. Okay. <laughs> from like the it's going 80s back or ways. 90s. Yeah. I mean, that's a long. So Turner and Hooch had a short lived single season Disney Plus TV show, which oh. we watched about half of. Like a like a uh, new version, a revival? Yeah. It, oh. it was like the it was like a it was a is a single season. Hmm. And it was awful. Okay. It was really, really yeah, bad. I didn't even know. Um uh, yeah, don't don't watch it. <laughs> waste my don't time. waste your time. Okay. It is very bad, and it's not. I don't think it's really any of the actors necessarily their fault. I don't particularly like the male lead all that much, mm. and it's very hard to do the dog thing. You know, in general, like a, you kind of need a movie so because it takes a lot of sh- takes and stuff mm-hmm. like that to get the dogs to do exactly what you want and. Hooch is always supposed right. to have been this sort of brute and gross <laughs> and right. slobbery mess. And, you know, they can't really do it. All. Anyways, the Tom Hanks movie was surprisingly good. I don't remember liking it that much when I was a kid, when I, when I actually saw it in the maybe theaters. I mean, I recall uh, it being popular, so it must have been some it was, reason. Yeah. It was. And it, but it was actually quite a bit. It, it's kind of funny. It's almost like this whole you get this nostalgia trip as you go back and watch these old movies. And they're like... They hu- I actually left the room to get to get the water or something like that. And when I came back, I was like, what happened? And my wife's like, I don't know. They were hugging, and now it's the next morning. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, that's right. Yeah, back then mm-hmm. they couldn't really, mm-hmm. you know, they it. had it. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, it, it was better than I remembered. Uh, Tom Hanks is very young, and it's one of his very, you know, very earliest movies. So it's, uh, it's kind of a fun romp down uh, memory lane. Right. And it wasn't a bad movie. And then I rewatched The Last Jedi again because <laughs> I had seen so many people recently bagging on that movie online. I was okay. like, is it really as bad as all these people are saying? And they're all so very wrong. It's the new Attack of Every the Clones? Every single one of them. <laughs> uh, it's just, they're just so wrong. Now, I even, this time appreciated the or i liked a little bit more the whatever that stupid planet was that, that they went off to the to casino planet yeah i actually didn't hate that scene as much okay. as i normally did. i get because he knew I, it was coming so i did but you know i i usually skip over that scene mm-hmm. and, like that whole section i'll just like fast forward through or whatever but uh god that's such a good movie and i really <laughs> felt like it was it was taking the taking the series in a new direction just the same way the empire well did. yes either things would have out. been by there uh, either having it consistently jj abrams throughout all three would have yeah. been more cohesive or not doing the about face and going from ryan johnson back to jj abrams just let ryan johnson continue. either one would have been we better all... than what happened of the about face right yeah. the 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 thing about jj abrams and and Love him or hate him, there's one true thing that we can all agree on is that that man cannot finish a thing properly, <laughs> right? Look at every single thing that he's done that I have loved. Like, I really he's like the first season of He's very good at starting Blacks. things. Very good I, at starting The things. first season of Alias is, like, mm-hmm. still one of my absolute most loved first seasons of, of anything. And in the second season, my wife and I are like, what is going on? And by the third <laughs> season, we just stopped. We're just like, this is, Lost I don't know. This is fringe. <laughs> yeah. And fringe too. I actually, I mean, I like a lot of that stuff in the first, I really, you know, the force awakens. I thought that was a perfectly good movie. Yeah. I enjoyed it quite a bit. I thought it was safe. It was very, but safe. it was, yeah. It was exactly what we needed in order to get us to the point where we can like, okay, I Reset. trust you. <laughs> I, I trust you that you're going to be able to go someplace with these characters. So then Ryan Johnson comes in and does something really, you know, really stretches it. And then they went, oh, people online are complaining. Mm-hmm. Ooh, we have to, let's get J.J. Abrams back because he won't screw up the ending. He never has before. <laughs> Oh jeez! Right. So uh, yeah, I watched that because I watched Obi Wan. I was like, yeah. oh my god, I mean, we're Star Wars. So I watched that as well. But that's what I did this week. Oh, uh, not a lot, unfortunately. I haven't had a lot of time to watch TV. It's, it's just been <laughs> I got kids. You know what you're gonna do. All right, this AV Rant the podcast answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. Go to our website where you can see our old episodes and show notes and. Flickr, image, banks, webs. I don't know. Anyways. Links to Flickr. Yeah, go over there. Uh, if you want to contact us, we got, of course, the AV Rant email address, question at AV Rant. You can go to facebook.com slash AV Rant podcast, youtube.com slash AV Rant, YouTube CR desync videos. I think the comments are back off. Yeah, I turned them off. 
It's you have if, to. If there's one I need to moderate, it's too many. I just I just, I'm just I don't need any additional stress of the slightest amount. So I, I, I think it's hilarious it. that you ask me if I, you can turn the comments back off. Yeah. Because well, when was the last time I said no? Well, that's why that. I'm not really <laughs> afraid. It's simple enough. Just just in case, just double checked with you. I literally don't care what happens on YouTube. <laughs> it's so funny. Well, then we're all right. <laughs> We're all right. Uh, contact us directly. Rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at First Reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. Very active Twitter account lately. Mm-hmm. Just been blowing up to tweets. For sure. Every time an episode comes out. Okay. Yeah, he something's was, getting knocked over there. I can see that. That's got to be a doggy what? hitting the camera. That's got to be what that just, is. He's hitting the stupid <laughs> camera. He's so bi- I gave him a bath yesterday. Let me tell you something about... Uh, yellow labs mm. which is what Felix is um, I expected him to like water mm-hmm. he does not mm. <laughs> does not at all <laughs> but he's a good he's a good puppy when it comes down to it but geez oh crime is that boy shit all right uh, let's thank our listeners of the week <laughs> I had to clean out the drain like the water went in the drain I was like what's going on handfuls of hair <laughs> Just handfuls. Like, you don't even have that much hair, dog. Uh, listeners of the week. Uh, come to Listener of the Week. Support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to avrent.com. Click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and leave us a PayPal donation. And we want to thank Raf for doing that this week. Thank you very much, Raf. Yeah, Raf. Thank you so much for the PayPal donation. Very much appreciate your financial support. We also have uh, patreon.com slash avrantpodcast. Go to sign up to become a monthly contributing listener member of our podcast community and friend to the podcast mm-hmm. and personal friend of Rob's. Okay. And sometimes I don't see the list, but all right. <laughs> it, <laughs> see, it sounds over there someplace. Anyways, Patreon won't pay us anymore because I have to fill out some ah, yeah. paperwork or whatever for taxes, but <laughs> it will pay us again eventually. So we have 139 patrons over at patreon.com, including Bertrand. So thank you to our patrons. Mm-hmm. Patreon.com slash podcast one more time. That's the place to go to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation. Big thanks to our 139 patrons. Bertrand, thank you for being one of them. So we've got, uh, if you can't support us financially, support us some way and let us know what you did. So Infinite Gary let Rhythmic Audio know he heard about their subwoofers from us. Did he buy one? Uh, he, he has it in his shopping cart. He's like waiting to make sure there isn't a sale happening for July 4th, which there very well might be and is coming yeah, up Yeah, that's soon. fair enough. That yep. is fair enough, yeah. But he did contact them and let them know. Thank you, Gary. We also got notes of gratitude from uh, some of our listeners. Uh, Alan and Bertrand are both uh, Two Hour Plus Club members. They uh, sure are. And Dale and Aris as well. So thank you very much, Alan, Bertrand, Dale, and Aris. Yeah, I'm Alan, Bertrand, you. Dale, and Aris, thank you all very much <laughs> for the notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going. The notes of encouragement are very much appreciated. So, uh, yeah, thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. So in the news, Emotiva is adding a monoblock model to its boss ox uh, amplifier lineup. They previously added four and six channel models, so you could get any number you wanted from two to seven channels. Starts at 450 for the A2, an additional uh, channel costing $50 more, up to $700 for the A7, which is pretty nice. Mm-hmm. That's, that's not that expensive. For... It's doing all right. 50 yeah. bucks a channel. So how much is the new monoblock A1? Well, it's 450, same price as the A2. Not 400. Not 400. <laughs> it has the highest wattage rating out of all the Bass Ox amplifier models, which is 200 watts into 8 ohms, full range with a 0.05 THD or total harmonic distortion. Mm-hmm. The 4 ohm the 4 ohm rating changes all of the parameters, so it's spec at 325, but that's only when playing 1 kilohertz with a 0.1% THD. They don't list a like for like 4 ohm rating. So generally speaking, okay, let me, let me finish reading this and then we'll talk about it. The Monoblock A1 is available now, and like the rest of the Boss Ox amplifiers, it only has an RCA input, no XLR. There's a toroidal, toroidal, like, well, I hate that word. Toroidal. Power supply, <laughs> I toroidal power supply inside, and it's class AB. So for those of you that are like, what are they talking about with these ratings? Generally speaking, you rate, uh, when we rate... Let me put it this way. When amplifiers are rated, what you want to see is a like for like mean. So it's, you know, if it's rated into 8 ohms, full range, whatever, you know, total harmonic distortion of 0.05, then you want to see the 4 ohm rating be, you know, full range, 
0.05 total home run distortion. That's right. Uh, you want to see that. And then you want to see the numbers double. Okay. Yeah, change so one wanna... parameter, not multiple parameters. That's yeah. what we would like. <laughs> so it's 200 watts into 8 ohms with those, but it's 325 watts into 4 ohms. So there's two ways that, in general, they spec amplifiers. And one way they do that is they make sure that that number doubles. <laughs> okay? Right, because they, ideally they... that's what would happen in a, in, yes. a, in a perfect theoretical amplifier. If yes. you were to half the impedance of the load, you would get exactly double the watts. It would just follow Ohm's law. Nothing else would change. That's right. But that's not how the world really works. No, there's so in order heat to and make distortion that... <laughs> and stuff that goes on. Yes, there are losses. <laughs> to, to make that happen, what they'll do is they'll they they take the the highest four ohm rating they can get and then they spec the eight ohm rating into you know half of that right you know basically which it, it will hit half of that easily yes. but it'll also it'll hit go beyond more than half that, of that spec quite yeah. easily yeah. so what they've done here instead is they've given you the best eight ohm rating right. that they can for this and then they're trying to get that four ohm rating as close to doubling as possible <laughs> which they can't do because of losses and other things mm -hmm. so 325 and they had to change the rating to get that they couldn't go into eight, eight, uh, to, to four ohms uh, full range they had to go into one kilohertz with a higher thd yeah. or total hummer distortion in order to give it even close to the 400 number that they want so does that mean that this is somehow an inferior amp to something else no what it means is this is just how they're giving you the specs that 200 watt which is what almost everybody's going to use is probably right up against what it can actually do right probably doesn't get much higher than 200 watts into eight ohms full uh full range with uh the 0.05 thd but it, it just doesn't have any headroom above that but that's fine that's what you're using it for anyways, and you know, don't worry about it. So it doesn't really bother me to see them do this. It is, you know, it, it, it it's fine. I, I don't know. It, it's just <laughs> it's it, it, it's just going to drive some people on the forums crazy because they're like, oh, well, you know, it's not really as powerful as they say. Like, Shut up. I just, just thought it was a shame it wasn't $400 to keep the pricing exactly the way that the rest of the lineup was. But there you go. It delivers a little bit more power right. into a single channel so, than any of the other models. So that's how they justify it. And I imagine that's because of the, the case and the power supply and the everything else. The chassis and everything, yes. Yeah, it's, it's pretty yeah, much Yeah, that's same. what's really... Yeah, yeah that's... I mean. So Perlison Audio has introduced their R series, a complete lineup of speakers that are less expensive than their flagship S series, which were the first speakers to receive the THX Dominus certification. Uh, the new R series is THX, X, THX Ultra certified, although the larger models are Dominus certified for use as surrounds, but not fronts. There are two tower models, a center and a stand mount uh, monitor, a bookshelf and a wedge-shaped surround. All of them, except the towers, can be wall-mounted. I don't know why they wouldn't let the towers wall mount. <laughs> you have to talk to a Perlison uh, dealer for exact prices on all models, but the largest R7T towers go for just under ten grand a pair, which is a half the price of the Dominus ones. So mm -hmm. to get the price down, the R series will use a silk tweeters and a HPF or hybrid pulp formulation woofers rather than, which is just paper which rather than the That's beryllium right. <laughs> tweeters and textured carbon fiber woofers from the s series and that textured carbon fiber woofers is what we used to call carbon fiber or uh kevlar but they can't call it that anymore because well, kevlar people no, got mad no because no carbon fiber kevlar isn't carbon fiber so it's uh, it's not aramid fiber. It is it is carbon fiber in the uh, in the yeah. S series, but that has no bearing on this new R series that we're talking about. No, so the R series retains Perlison's DPC or Directivity Pattern Control driver layout with one inch drivers above and below the tweeter, all in a waveguide. Sensitivity and power handling are a bit lower than the S series as expected. Models with at least two woofers can can all be biamped, and all models are rated at four ohms. So. You know, if you're looking at your bass axe, you can get 325 into that thing, one kilohertz. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, 
yeah great i guess i mean not exactly they're, they're trying to bring their technology to a lower price point about half the price of the flagship s series but yes you're giving up the fancy beryllium drivers you're giving up the fancy carbon fiber drivers we're going to silk dome and paper woofers uh which are, are definitely much more uh common and pedestrian driver materials uh but yeah a lot of money is going into the design of that uh I mean, it's like tweeter, 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 or like mid tweeter. What mid. is that? I'm looking at it right now. Yep. I'm like, why? I mean, I guess they're just, and it's horn loaded. Well, yeah, wave the, guy the, loaded, not quite a horn. But yeah, not quite a horn. Yeah, yeah. Or yep. So that's good. It's very strange. Seems like maybe they're using the exact same cabinets. I'm not sure, but mm. they don't look tremendously different. Oop, I scrolled up. Uh, Roku and Walmart have teamed up to show you Walmart products on your Roku streaming device that you can purchase directly from your Roku. No additional browser or QR code needed because that's what I wanted in my life. Mm -hmm. So have a credit card with Roku Pay and you'll be able to click on targeted product ads, confirm you want to purchase, and it will be ordered from Walmart. Roku says they want to look for opportunities to build deeper commerce experiences that meet customers where there are. Let me tell you something, Roku. <laughs> I don't buy anything without at least tr I don't just click on something and say, yes, send it to me unless I am already so sure of the pricing mm -hmm. that I know that there's not a better deal or that's a reasonable deal. I will always, always at least do some sort of cursory search about it. So I am never buying anything from a screen that pops up on my TV and I never want there to be a screen that pops up on my TV. <laughs> also, so. as far as targeted advertising goes, have you ever had anything other than what you just bought gets advertised to you for the next two weeks? Because that's what happens to me. Whatever I just bought, which means <sighs> I searched. already have it. I yeah. yeah. Even that, though. It's I get, usually I, stuff I actually purchased yeah. is what gets advertised to me. It's like, yeah, I already know about it. That's why I just bought it. So, um, yeah, I guess for items that I might reorder, but... Oh, well, I think they're just hoping that uh, somebody's kids get a hold of the remote and order a whole bunch of stuff, and that's yeah, how they're going to make money off of this one. I, Since I do so many searches for work-related articles that I'm writing for AV Gadgets, I often get targeted ads about things I have searched mm -hmm. recently but I have not purchased. Uh, and I'm so cognizant of this that whenever I'm buying something for my wife, I have to... I don't do incognito mode because hmm. I can't be bothered. So I just search for it. I find what I want. I look for it. Look at all this stuff. And then I search for a bunch of other stuff yeah. so that the <laughs> the algorithm <laughs> will be like, oh, he's off. not interested in that anymore. Nice. He's now interested in these other things. So that's how that's how I do that. But fine, whatever. Okay. Comments from listeners. Andrew from AV Gadgets waxed his high gloss mm -hmm. speakers and he's very happy with the results. He's supposed to be writing an article for this for me. Okay. It is, uh, he asked me if he could write an article about waxing his speakers and i was like is that a euphemism am i supposed to know what that means <laughs> but yes he 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 has a high gloss black speakers and he used automotive wax to wax okay. to get the little scratches or whatever and he says it, i mean it looks pretty good it looks mirrored finished looks like it's so. absolutely fine I, I will just say if you happen to have for some reason some kind of uh fragile finish on your speakers or you're just concerned about it my usual go-to for uh polishing speakers whether they're a satin finish which is usually a little bit harder to clean without marring the finish in some way a satin right. finish or a high gloss uh i'll use uh piano polish because mm. they usually talk about a piano gloss finish or a satin black finish that is similar to a satin finished piano so uh like cory uh piano polish is probably the most well-known brand c-o-r-y uh it's not ridiculously expensive although for the tiny little bottle paying you know 15 dollars for the tiny little bottle does seem a little overpriced for whatever might be in there but it's not you know all the money in the world so yeah i'll just mention that cory piano polish is something that uh, that i would easily use on any speakers because if it's safe for your grand piano it is safe for your speakers I will say though that the automotive, if he if he did use automotive, I think that's what. He well, told I know me like new finish, new finish is pretty good on almost anything, you know, the synthetic yeah. wax. He uh, the thing so in cycling when because I've got the way my bike is painted or colored or whatever, like there's lighter colors near the chain mm -hmm. and near the front tire. It 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 looks nice, uh, but it immediately gets oil all over it. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, that they told me to do, and I haven't done it, uh, but they told me to do it at the, the bike shop, and I asked him, like, how do I keep this stuff clean, man? It's impossible. He goes, well, clean it really good and then put autom automotive uh, wax or polish on it. Mm -hmm. And what that'll do is it creates a barrier and the the 
oils, the, the grease will just slide right off when you're mm -hmm. when you're washing it. So in this case, I'm not sure, but you know, maybe the automotive or whatever he used might be slightly more grease resistant, mm. which was of course what's on your fingers and mm -hmm. leaves the fingerprint more. So I don't know. Anyways, don't care going on. Questions. Terry. Terry has a dedicated theater room with roughly 13 by 20 by 8 with two rows of seats and then a riser for the back row. He's left three feet of space behind his back row and his two rows of seats are about 15 feet and 9 feet from the screen. The room acoustics were treated with 12 panels from Gick based on their free room advice. Mm -hmm. um, and now that we know that Dolby says basically you can wall this floor to floor to ceiling that room and it's still in there, we can no longer say, "Well, baby, that's my few." It's too not their recommendation, <laughs> but yes, apparently it falls within acceptable. Falls spec. within the guidelines. That's all I care sure about. Sure, looked like, like it just... anyway. What we talked about last week. <laughs> so yeah, that seven point two point four configure a speaker configuration using all Golden Ear speakers, Triton two towers, and Super Center XL up front with Super Sat surrounds and surround backs plus. Invisa in-ceiling speakers for top fronts and top rears, labeled as front heights and rear heights. It's all run from a Marantz SR6011 receiver. I will say my children have not woken up <laughs> yet, and I'm expecting them to start milling around. So I've got the door open. When that mm -hmm. happens, you might, I might disappear all for right. a few seconds. But I'm just going to go across the room and close I'll the door. I'll be here. I, I just, if I don't do that, then when the dogs... The little dog hears the people out there. She'll start scratching at the door gotcha. to get out because she's got to go out there and lick their ankles because she's <laughs> evil. Uh, he decided he wanted to try it and upgrade his immersive audio experience. So he added a pair of monoprice amber in ceiling speakers as top middles. And to create the six overhead channels, he did the three receiver craziness that Rob still thinks he might do someday. Yep. With a Denon 2310 handling the left side group of overhead speakers and matrix scene. The left top middle with and a Denon 2307 handling the right side group of overheads and matrixing the right top middle. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I mean, how's that going to sound good? It's two different receivers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so hard to do Dolby Pro Logic. I know, right? It's Phantom Center, what are you talking Stereo about? to three channel. Oh, how could it possibly do it? Uh, he says he's still not fully satisfied with his immersive audio experience, although he wasn't able to say exactly in what way. He just wants better. And he's thinking he will eventually replace all his golden ear speakers in that effort. But first, he is quite set on getting a Denon X6700H. For one thing, it can process 13 speakers all on its own, so he won't need the three receiver setup anymore. And the top middle speakers won't be have to be matrix. He's hoping he'll notice an improvement. Uh, yeah, don't hold your breath on that. Uh, uh, <laughs> It's... Um... I don't know, my man. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you about that. All right, okay. And second, the X6700H comes with Oro. Mm -hmm. I mean, it still does. They didn't. They didn't <laughs> and retroactively remove it. <laughs> and he's seen several YouTubers praising the Oromatic up mixer, although Gene Audioholics kind of poo pooed it. So Terry is hoping we can offer an opinion. The X6700. H isn't cheap, and he's hoping to get more than a marginal gain. What do we say? I don't think the receiver is the place where you're gonna like. I, okay, so it sounds to me, and I'm gonna be honest with you, it sounds to me. So he's got 13 by 20 by eight foot room. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, I imagine he sits in the front row. So he's got surround back speakers, which normally I would poo poo, but <laughs> he's sitting far enough oh, away yes. from them that they're probably fine. Uh, I don't think that. Well, first of all. It is almost never the case that I'm going to say that the receiver is going to make a huge sonic difference yeah. in your room. As long as you're not going from a literally can't do the thing yes. to a something that can do the thing. Indeed. Now, you already have the two, three receiver stupid. I mean, certainly this will thing. simplify that. There's no question about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. It will save some space. Mm -hmm. uh, will that center speaker top middle having it having its own uh amplifier channel and being able to be i guess affected by the um uh odyssey room correction will that make mm. a huge difference oh, god no <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that really gives me pause is more than a marginal gain, because I, I can say, for example, the X6700H does DTS-X Pro, and nothing in your current setup does DTS-X Pro. Uh, but to me, the largest advantage of being able to do DTS-X Pro is being able to have front-wide speakers, not 
the six overheads. Um, it, it, and and that I would call a marginal gain. <laughs> you know, so I mean, more than a marginal gain, I just don't see it happening. Not not yeah. if. None of the speakers change. You just swap out what is processing your 13 speakers because that's really what you're talking about is swapping out what's processing your 13 speakers. Um, I mean, a change in amplification, we wouldn't expect any noticeable difference anyway because your room size is not gigantic and you are not sitting yeah. super far away. So I don't, I would not anticipate anticipate you getting even a marginal gain, let alone more than a marginal gain. <laughs> what? Right, not for that price for sure. Yeah, I mean, like, because he... he like I, I asked and he didn't really get back with like a concrete, this is th this is what I feel is lacking or this is what I want to right. gain from. Because I was like, do you just do you just want to hear your overheat speakers more than you're hearing them? Because yeah, uh, um, you know, Atmos is pretty subtle most of the time. You don't really like notice the overhead speakers that much. And if that's what you want is to notice them, well, you kind of either just want to use DTS X up mixing. Um, sure. Which, or just increase the Or just levels. increase the trim levels. You know, which you can uh, do without buying a whole new AV receiver. Um, if it's more a matter of, I can hear them just fine, but it doesn't sound cohesive. Because, uh, you know, I've seen people sort of uh, complain about that. That I would probably attribute more to the speakers than to the AV receiver that is processing things. Because with Golden Ear speakers, which are really quite directional and do have... Uh, sort of coloration to the sound of their own, uh, getting it to sound like it isn't speaker there, speaker there, speaker there, versus just cohesive and I can't actually tell where any of the speakers are placed. It's a bit more of a challenge with those speakers. Those are the speakers where it's good that the Invisa in-ceiling speakers that he uses for the overheads are actually angled because they don't have the type of wide dispersion that you would want for in-ceiling speakers firing straight down. They are ones that you do kind of need to aim at the listening position. And he's got two rows of seats, so is every seat actually going to be within the Kona dispersion of the Golden Ear speakers? I kind of hesitate to say that I would expect that to be the case. Yeah. I would expect that if you're aiming everything at the main listing position, that might sound really good. But maybe the thing he's not fully satisfied with is that he goes and sits in the back row or one of the side seats and it doesn't sound as good as the main listing position. But I wouldn't really attribute that to the AV receiver. I would attribute that more to the speakers in this instance. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm so just I'm two hesitant. Rows, two Okay, if okay, my children are up, okay. so I'm gonna have to close that door in a second. But the big, if you're looking for a sonic improvement, mm -hmm. okay, my number one, like with that, it, like I say, I want my system to sound better. Room treat, room room treatments. But he's done that. Acoustic panels. Mm -hmm. That would be my first go to answer without knowing anything other than mm -hmm. just you want. And and if you said I've already done that, and he, he, this man has, yes, then it is speaker upgrade. And yeah. or in your case, it it might actually be a speaker downgrade as far as price. Could be because those Triton towers are not. Oh yeah, cheap. those are expensive speakers. You got. Uh, but a different style of speaker that has a yeah. wired dispersion that is. Uh, this is not a huge room. I mean, you could no. get THX certified speakers, mm -hmm. you know, from a number of places. I mean, we've talked certainly about certainly mono price. Over over again. Those would be and easily obtainable. They, and these, you know, I, I mean. You don't need towers <laughs> to start. No, with not in not in this here. size room and these distances. So, I mean, there is a lot. There's a lot here that you could do that that could make a difference. I mean, and he I could, don't think it's the receiver. He could also just dig more into Odyssey with the Odyssey Editor app, or perhaps even paying the two hundred dollars to get uh, Odyssey X. Although I I don't really think that's necessary. But uh, again, if it's more a matter of maybe he just wants more bass, or like we say, wants to notice the overhead or the surround or the surround back speakers more, you can sort of manipulate all of that in the Odyssey Editor app. And that's something where, I mean, would it be a little bit easier to do in the X6700H just because all 13 speakers are being processed in the one Avery receiver? It would be a little bit easier, but it's not yeah. that you're genuinely doing something drastically different from what you could do already with, with what you already own. So I just, all I'm... Hesitant about is because I don't think getting the X6700H is like gonna be a bad experience. I just don't really foresee you uh, having this noticeable. Oh yeah, this was totally worthwhile audible upgrade. It would be right. more convenient. You get DTS X Pro, which is kind of nice, but mainly if you just want to do front wides, that's what I'm more concerned about with that one. Uh, I mean, he's kind of throwing Oro in there because that's the other thing he would get, and it's like the 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 thing about Oro to me is 
I mean, you're not getting it for content that's actually mixed in Oro because there's exceedingly little of that. Yeah. You would be getting yeah. it for the Oromatic up mixer. And it's kind of funny because on the one hand, what the Oromatic up mixer does is rather simplistic. It duplicates the sounds of the speakers that the height speakers are directly above, adds a little bit of delay to those height channels, and rolls off the high frequencies. It's not super sophisticated as to what the up mixer is doing. That said, it doesn't mean the end result isn't very pleasing to a lot of people because right. by doing exactly that, by just duplicating the sounds, then adding a slight delay and a high frequency roll off, it really does mimic the sense that you are in a substantially larger room than you actually are. Your brain takes those cues exactly as created by the aromatic up mixer and it's like, oh, I'm in a bigger room than then the physical walls are telling me that I am. And sometimes that's what you want. Sometimes you want the sense that you're in this bigger, more expansive space. And it actually is very effective at that. So I don't agree with the take that it's like this super sophisticated processing that's doing something that Dolby and DTS could never, ever do. No, it's actually fairly simplistic processing. But the end result is kind of nice. Um, so... Like I, obviously, if you got it, I wouldn't be against trying it. <laughs> There's nothing wrong sure. with that. But it's it's hard for me to say that that is like a super justifiable reason uh, for doing that. Like I agree with with Gene in that it's like it's a little bit of a gimmick. Like I say, it's not it's not super complicated yeah, what they're doing there. <laughs> but yeah, the the end result is kind of is I like Dolby Surround up mixing the best, but it is by far the most subtle. Um, it, mm. it, it doesn't put a lot into the overhead speakers when you're doing Dolby Surround up mixing, but what it does put up there is kind of like what should be up there in real life. It's it's quite good at, at pulling out of the other channels what ought to be overhead, which isn't that much. Uh, DTS uh, up mixing, DTS Neuralex up mixing is kind of ridiculous. It puts way too much, way too loud, but if what you want is to notice your overhead speakers are playing something, then that's the one to do because, yeah, way way too much and way too loud, but you certainly hear them. Uh, so I, I, that's all. I can't get on board with saying you're going to get a more than marginal gain. I don't foresee that being the case. But if you just want convenience to try something a little bit different, okay, if you're set on getting it, because it's not going to be a bad experience, just I wouldn't expect a big upgrade. Right. I, and it doesn't seem to me like he's saying that he's overall just not happy with the sound. He just kind of wants better channel separation. I or, don't. Yeah, I don't know, you know exactly what it, it is. A, it, it, that that doesn't allow me to say things like uh, get the uh, Odyssey, whatever it is. Yeah, it, Odyssey X, Multi QX, yeah, Multi QX, the two hundred dollars, uh, and start playing with that, or get a, a mini DSP and a Room UQ Wizard mm -hmm. and you mic one from Cross Spectrum Labs and do that. I, I don't feel like that's what the issue here. Mm -hmm. I think the issue is you've kind of run into the wall of what your speakers can provide for you. That's my suspicion too. And you you want something else and you're noticing that this is not enough. So, I mean, the fun part to me, and it's annoying, but it's true. The fun part of home theater is speakers and testing mm -hmm. them and listening to them and going out and you know, seeing them. I mean, that's the, the sexy part of the <laughs> home theater to me. Uh, you know, re playing with receivers and amplifiers and stuff like that. It's like, oh, yeah, I got it. I'm so happy with it. And it just sits over there being a amp. Mm. I mean, it just doesn't do anything that you can really enjoy. Unless it's a mon it's a Macintosh and it's got the <laughs> right. VU, VU meters them. on them. And they're pretty blue. Yeah. Uh, but... Yeah, I, I do think that the the real the real benefit you're looking for here is different speakers, and uh, we can give you lots of recommendations, but you should probably just go to a store and <laughs> listen to some stuff. Dan, back sometime before 2008, Dan and a group of five other guys uh, over at Tweeter Home Entertainment Group, no idea who they are, uh, did an AV receiver shootout. One guy ran the, speak, uh, the speaker switcher that allowed them to instantly switch between which AV receiver was powering the speakers. They had Denon, Yamaha, Pioneer Elite, Sony ES, and a B&K receiver. None of the listeners knew which was which. They were just identified as A, B, C, blah, blah, blah. There was no room correction or EQ apply, many of them didn't even offer any form of room correction back then. <laughs> Delays and volume levels were all manually evened out beforehand. They used the same disc player and the same songs with the same timestamps for all of the listening tests, and they ran the tests with four different pairs of speakers, including 
uh, Mirage OM10, Vienna Acoustics Mozart's Clips Reference Towers, and some Sonus Faber, Fiber, Faber, Faber, Faber mm-hmm. bookshelves. No processing applied, no DSP, just playing what came off the disc straight through, which we claim would result in all the AV receivers sound the same in a blind test. Nobody in their their group of listeners came to that conclusion. Uh, so for Dan, the, the den was on the warm side, the highs were calm, the mid-range was comfortable, and the lows were full. The dam- Yamaha was bright, and it was more punchy, meaning the dynamic range was greater than the den. Okay conclusion uh pioneer elite and the bay uh, the b and k sound similar to each other both full bodied and cleared full body always cracks me up it's like a beer uh but different than the other receiver models and assuming es was similar to denim but a bit more laid back he thinks their tests were pretty fair and valid so he's puzzled how we could have we could have heard a blind comparison in which a variety of AV receivers all sound the same. He's not arguing about any of this to him. It's all in good fun. And he enjoys what we have to say. It's simply a case where his experience tells him something very different from what we said about it. So he's hoping we can discuss it. All right. Uh, so s- setting up a very good test of anything is much harder than it really f- seems yeah. as somebody you know okay so, now as a reminder for those of you that have not heard me say this because i haven't said it recently my background is in uh essentially research psychology mm-hmm. it's called program evaluation and one of the things that we do that we focus on is eliminating bias from tests as much as possible in order to make sure that um the results you think you get are the results you actually get mm-hmm. which is why uh we never make any conclusions about anything because yeah. we're always like, there's probably some bias yeah, in there someplace that I haven't gotta, seen. It. Yeah, be a little bit wishy washy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because it creeps in there in ways that you don't expect. That's right. Um in, in in very many different ways. So he's outlined pretty clearly here uh many of the variables that he felt were important mm-hmm. in making sure that the tests were as That's why I as included possible. all the details. So right. Which that. is great. Mm-hmm. Um but there are still, I I can see quite a few little instances of oh, yeah. where bias may have cre- crept in here uh, more than you might have thought. That being said, you know, let's just take, let's just, let's just throw all that out. Let's just say that this is the world's most perfect test, mm-hmm. you know, and that we, they were really testing only how those receivers sounded and nothing else okay um the first thing that he's you know he's uh talked about is this is now what 14 years ago sure. is that right is, is that my math right on there i'm yeah. terrible doing math on the fly <laughs> so 14 years ago and this is before room correction uh and and there's no other processing applied here could the receivers in at that time been different sounding uh, my my thought would be probably not at very much, if at all. Uh, I mean, you, we've got measurements of the amplifier output sections right. in test conditions going back many, many years at this point, like Audioholics, for example, has those. And it's like, man, when you just under test condition, right? So not into an actual speaker, but just into a an, an 8-ohm resistor or a 4-ohm resistor, right. uh, like it's a pretty darn flat line coming out of virtually any AV receiver uh, what's coming out of the amplifier section there. And they were only driving a pairs of speakers at a time. So it uh, unless they were in a huge room really far away, we wouldn't expect there to be non-linearities just coming out. But sure. we, don't, we don't know for certain, but we wouldn't expect it, expect it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so generally speaking, I mean, I would expect that at this point of time, at 2008, that any differences between these amplifier sections would have been inaudible. Mm. So why did they hear mm-hmm. something? Uh, there's just so many various and sundry reasons that, that uh, some of them are real. Like there were real things that were happening that could have uh, affected how one sounded versus the other. But most of them are just situational and psychological. They just, you know, they just, they just, as you flick back and forth between the different things, you find you're you're trying to find a difference, so you do find a difference. There's definitely that. If you like, for one thing, they came into this knowing what they were 
uh, comparing were different AV receivers. Now, unfortunately, just that knowledge is enough to swing right. what you report back because uh, ideally you would have a bunch of people come into a room and listen to some things and not even know what's being tested. <laughs> and they would Well, yeah. I mean, you I know, mean, like if you want to try and get to removing all variables, that that's going they a bit have, far. They but. have the the, the, the the participants should have the most limited amount of knowledge. It doesn't yeah. mean they can't have any. Sure. But they they wouldn't know, for example, what speakers were playing. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't know what uh what receivers were even in the test. They might know, okay, we're gonna be testing out, you know, how these two th these these different things sound and that's about as much information as you would have given mm. them now of course this is a casual thing between yeah. you know as a group of friends and they came up with the test themselves so of course they're gonna know and that's again fine the the, the thing about these the thing about this type of testing and I, I I've actually wrote about this recently I don't think I've published the article yet though uh Maybe I did the a B, uh, with what's a blind test. Mm. The thing about blind tests, which is not what's happening here, but the thing about blind tests is it's to suss out very, very subtle differences mm -hmm. or differences that can be affected uh, by uh, by very minute things. Okay, so what they want is, for instance, if you're testing a you know, uh, an aspirin type substitute like a Tylenol or, or Advil, they want to know that the pill itself is making the difference and not the placebo right. effect, yeah. right? So they do that by giving some people a placebo and giving other people not. So because some of those placebo people are going to feel better, mm -hmm. guaranteed. Definitely. Either just by time or because the, they feel like the pill is doing mm -hmm. something for them. Same reason that people that think crystals are making a difference. You know, it's the same sort of thing. You know, they think, feel that way. Therefore, they, they come up. So they're trying to suss out these little differences. In audio, we, I don't think see why we care <laughs> about subtle differences. <laughs> you know, let's be dead honest here. Do you care, really, really care that your receiver is slightly warmer than or slightly more, you know, less warm or slightly brighter or slightly more tame or full bodied, whatever the hell that mm -hmm. means? Do you really care if it's if, if if it's so small of a difference that you have to be like in a completely silent room? you know in, in a in a uh an anechoic chamber with you know all these controls in place and then you can kind of sort of pick out the difference mm -hmm. is that important to you or is it important that you know this you know like what's the real difference that makes the difference here and it's like that one's 500 dollars less i'm taking the one or that's this one has less. good room correction and the other one doesn't and that's right i mean there's like a thousand other things that make that. a difference yeah um like one thing i wanted to mention is of course we've seen that like the reason I included Dan's takes, uh, and that wasn't exactly verbatim. I shortened it a bit down. Yeah, he sure, had, sure, he sure, went sure. into more, but I mean, it's a lot of the uh, subjective terms that we see in professional reviews, and and this overgeneralization. Like I'm not accusing Dan of saying all Denon sound this way and all no, Yamaha no, 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 sound no. that way, but I have seen that type of language from other people, particularly on forums and that, where they're like Denon's just sound this way, Pioneers just sound this way. That is a gross overgeneralization. The most you could say is these particular not even models, these particular units in the yeah, test. Yeah, you'd have to do it with um, more, many, many models, many yes, units within yes, those across. models uh, to, but to I, make it I'm not accusing Dan of saying that because that wasn't the language no. he used, but I just wanted to mention that because I've seen it as such a common thing. The other one is by what mechanism? That's always the question we have to ask in, uh, you know, any sort of statistical or scientific study where people are saying that they're detecting a difference, then we have to ask, by what mechanism? How is that happening? Because like I say, if we go back to the measurements and we're looking at what is coming out of these amplifier sections and all of them are ruler flat lines across the entire audible range, then how is it that people are detecting a dis uh, difference? Now, it could be purely psychological. They want to hear a difference, so they do, or they come in expecting to, so they do. That is still possible even under the conditions that he set up. But Let's let's propose that everybody did hear a difference. Is there a mechanism by which that could have happened under the conditions that Dan outlined here? And the thing is, I would argue that there is a, a real mechanism by which this could happen, which is all of these speakers were one full range, 
and you had a group of listeners, and I don't think everybody stayed in exactly the same seat throughout this entire test. And if you changed seats, you're going to hear a difference in the bass, which will definitely lead you to saying one speaker is brighter or one speaker is, um, you know, more veiled or full bodied or whatever it is. We can definitely have differences in the bass from seat to seat that were not necessarily lean accounted on one for. arm. You can yep. lean on one arm or, yeah, of the or chair. Or maybe everybody did. And then lean on, <laughs> That's right. lean on the other they arm of the chair. They leaned a little forward, slouched and... down for a little bit. Uh, what can happen in the base? And we are not, as humans, able. I'm not even going to say good or bad at I'm going to say we are not able to distinguish whether it was the bass that changed changed our perception of the treble or a change in the treble that changed our perception of the treble. If the bass changes, it alters our perception of the treble and there's nothing we can do about it. I don't care how experienced a listener you are, it changes our perception of what's going on across the whole frequency range. None of the four speakers that were used are what I would call linear accurate speakers. <laughs> All of those are examples of colored speakers that have their own frequency response idiosyncrasies, the Mirage, the Vienna Acoustics, the Klipsch, and the Sonus Faber. I, I wouldn't put any of those as perfectly linear speakers, uh, but if we're just comparing like for like and we're switching between AV receivers powering the same speakers, hopefully we can do a more valid AB comparison. But I, I would attribute a huge amount of this to the bass response, which is why if I'm trying to detect it, and again, I'm like, Tom, I don't really care uh, because I can tell, I can see from the measurements that the distance, uh, differences, if there are any, are so small that I'm not worried about that. But if I am trying to compare AV receivers or amplifiers to detect a difference, I will filter off the base because there is no escaping the room and my position and the speaker's position within the room being affected in the base. There's no escaping it. We'd have to all go to an anechoic chamber or an uh, uh, outdoor field with no walls anywhere within 50 feet of any direction. Like we'd yeah. have to do that to get away from the base playing way more a role in this than anything else. So yeah. because of so that, yeah, that, I think that, yeah, I think that's the mechanism by which a real difference might have been heard. So in... I did a uh, speaker shootout many, many years ago where I put a massive, a massive screen of speaker cloth across the front of my room, mm -hmm. on like a clothesline. And then behind there, I had a uh, four, like four or five different speakers and amplifiers that, uh, you know, level matched everything. I had an amplifier where I could switch from one side to the other. Uh, and they had, they had their own volume knobs and everything. Uh, and then I had four people in the room and I made them all sit in the same seat the entire time. They weren't allowed to, to move. They weren't allowed to talk to each other mm -hmm. or discuss their results mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Like we took breaks. And I'm like, you get, you guys cannot talk yep, about anything. Sequestered. You have, you have to, yes, you can come in here and we can, you know, we got, we can, whatever. And, you know, vastly dip for the most part, uh, the, the, the kind of, the kind of, feedback I got from all the different speakers was pretty inconsistent, except when the differences were very obvious. And when those differences mm -hmm. were very obvious, the, it, everybody agreed. And uh, it was, you know, it, it, that's where we kind of come up with uh, these things. And like what Rob was saying, you know, it, you know, this was, this, these were Dan's experiences with mm -hmm. what, and I don't know how consistent these experiences were across everybody who was in that room. Right. You know, they may have come up with some different stuff based on where they were sitting. And Which like would be Rob interesting said, because if, if somebody else said that the Yamaha was the warmer one and the Denon one was the brighter one, well, that's going to be an indication that, I mean, maybe you both heard a difference between the two, but why are they opposite? Because I'm not saying that was the case, but it could have been. We, we don't, yeah. We're not sure. So it, it's just, it's such a comp, you know, there's so many things that go into us hearing things and you all know this, right? You all know this, that how your brain works. You all, everybody who's listening to this podcast has glanced to the side, thought they saw something, their fight or flight mechanisms, you know, their heart rate shot up. They thought they saw something and it's in, and their body reacted. And then they looked again and go, Oh, that was just a shadow. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was just a dog. Oh, that was just, you know, whatever. I can't tell you how, and just now I, w I glanced out, uh, <laughs> That's why out the it. door and I thought I, I, you know, I, I thought I saw 
something moving in the other room and it freaked me out for a second. <laughs> this is your brain, you know, doing the best it can with the information it has. You know, it's your, your amygdala and all sorts of other mechanisms going on in there that all affect this. And it is almost too complex for us to really suss out these very, very small differences that happen. And it can be done by the, you know, a human can do it. But like Rob's saying, we have to control for so many variables in order for you to be at the point where you can really, really hear and, and say with any sort of confidence that what you're hearing is is not some other artifact mm. of the testing environment or the testing methodology. Scientific rigor is hard. It is not easy. And you know, everybody's like, oh, all you got to do is this. No, <laughs> no, you know, you've, te you've controlled for a lot of variables and I applaud you guys. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very fun yeah, experiment. I never to want to do. discourage people from doing like, no. the, I don't call this pseudoscience. This isn't, but this no. is semi science. <laughs> it's, it's not fully scientifically rigorous, which would be a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of repeated trial, uh, which, which isn't realistic. So, you know, like, yeah. uh, Mythbusters, right? Mythbusters, they're following scientific processes, but ultimately it's semi-scientific what they did. So are their conclusions something that is, you know, beyond reproach? Absolutely not. It would have to be tested over and over and over again, refined, right. refined, refined, refined. And, you but, know, for a TV program, they're not going to do that. Yeah, published and then recreated by other scientists right. in different in environments and everything else. Uh, you know, but it's fun. And it, yes. it, 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 get, it, it it's something fun to do. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, certainly something to be applauded. And it, you know, it, it gives you some, some information that, you know, uh, about the testing environment and stuff. I like, like, I'm listening to all this. And I'm like, I don't understand why you had more than one set of speakers. Mm. I mean, that just, that just extends the testing it time sure so much that you get listener fatigue, you get exhausted. But they were you get probably concerned about drained. the mentions of, you know, under different loads, you know, you're, there's certain amplifiers are going to react differently. So they were trying to account for that. Now, now they're trying to account for two different test scenarios, you know, yeah. so yeah, but I, I can see how that happens easily. It's, you know, it's, I, I was talking to my wife about this the other day and it, it, it statistics is so counterintuitive so often. Mm. And that's one of the reasons why people have such a hard time understanding like polling results and stuff like that when it comes to uh, news reports. And, and and the people who report the news don't understand it any better than anybody else does. So they say it wrong all the time. And it, it's infuriating to those of us. And I don't claim to be a statistics expert by any stretch but you do I've have taken a proper lot of education sports. in it yeah. <laughs> I, i've taken a lot of statistics classes and i've done i've done statistics and one of the things that's so interesting you would think like intuitively it makes sense like if we're gonna do a test on av receivers we have to control for as many things as possible but we also want to make sure that we're testing as many things as we can mm. At the same time, you know, we're not just testing the receiver. We want to make sure that we're testing the receiver under different loads and blah, blah, blah. And we're going to do this. We're going to do that. Well, the more variables you add to uh, uh, more testing variables that you add, the more likely you're going to have a false positive. Sure. It's just statistically more likely that like it's the, the best statistical test tests one thing <laughs> and controls for everything else. Yeah. And and then and then when, after at the end, you're like, well, does that mean that this one thing that you've tested for you can say conclusively you know something about it and they're like nope we have to test for all the other stuff individually as well <laughs> and then compare them and then do a bunch of other stuff so it's very hard but you know this is a fun experiment this mm -hmm. is a this is a fun experiment uh you know i think the I only would... the only I, I don't want to call it criticism critique uh only critique i would have would be to not formulate a conclusion that because yeah. this isn't like we're happy with the test that you did we just wouldn't go oh i did that test so now i feel confident that a av receivers do f sound different from each other and b denon sound warm and yamaha sound bright and you know i'm not again i'm not saying dan did that, that but some stuff. people do yeah, yeah. right that that is the part where i go oh no we just have to take a step back and go i have done this one type of test uh i got some results that Maybe I can't fully explain. More testing required. That's about the only conclusion right. we can come to. That, so that, no, that would it, be my only critique. There. Yeah, because what you would want to do, like, for example, in this exact situation, is you'd want to redo the test the, the next day mm -hmm. where you're sitting in a different seat and somebody else is controlling everything. I mean, there's so many sources of bias here. It's so funny. I mean, uh, you know, one of the reasons we have double blind tests is because there's uh, there's 
the effect of the te- like what's called the I don't remember the exact name of it. It's like the tester's effect, like yeah. the tester expectancy effect. And what that does is if the tester thinks that something is is going to happen, it tends to happen. Yep. <laughs> so w- one of the tests they did to 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 test this effect was they had they had a people read the instructions as monotone as they could Mm -hmm. and then record them on the cassette Mm -hmm. and then play those those instructions for the the people in the test and then the people would do whatever the test was Mm -hmm. right but they would tell that the test was really to tell the people who were reading the instructions which one they that was the one that was going to make the difference Mm -hmm. and then they would read the monologue they would play it and everything, like as far as we can tell, everything looks, sounds, monotone, everything else. But still, their expectancy mm. affected the outcome of the second in part the of the giving test. of instructions to the test uh, people. Under Even test. though they're not in the room, That's they're right. reading it monologue on onto a onto a cassette tape. Or this was a while ago, obviously. You know, they still. And, and as far as I know, unless somebody has done some more research that I'm not aware of, which is certainly possible. They still don't know why that's the, the, the case. Like, how how can the person not even be in the room mm. and still affect the outcome of the test? Uh, which is probably one of the reasons why your kids thrive better in school under a teacher who believes in them. Right. Versus the teacher who is just like, I hate these kids. I can't, you know, I'm just, I'm punching, the, I'm punching my time until I Wanting to please the person who's giving the instructions yeah. has a big impact. Yeah. So, anyways. All right. Alan. Alan got a Sofa Baton X1 hub-based remote. He set it up and has been using it for a few weeks now. He thinks it's just about ready to, he's just about ready to introduce it to his family and to let them try using it as the primary remote. The update that uh, allows it to send commands immediately when you push a button rather than the first button push only waking up the remote and then having to push the button a second time to actually send a command, that's a game changer for him and probably for me Mm -hmm. if I ever use the ink thing. (laughs) He's got two issues he'd like to ask us about. First, he's got an, uh, an infrared sensor that controls some of his lights. He has tried many times to get the Sofa Baton Hub to learn the IR commands from the original remote, but it just doesn't seem to work. Any ideas on getting the Sofa Baton to learn these specific commands? Andrew also has problems with his lights yep. uh, as well. This seems to be a common theme mm-hmm. and one that I know that they're working on. So, yep. yeah, you're going to want to tell somebody I yeah think. two two suggestions one email them directly it's sofa baton at outlook.com uh they've got that uh right on their website so they're a- it's absolutely fine you don't have to go through the community channel where it might get lost you can email them directly uh and they are really quite responsive uh so they, they are actively trying to add as many code bases as possible so be specific tell them exactly what model of uh lighting system that you have tell them exactly what model of ir sensor that you have installed in your wall or wherever it is that it picks it up uh, and and get that information to them. Can't promise that it'll get added to the code base, but they are very much actively trying to add more code. So that's step number one. Step number two, when it comes to the learning of IR commands using the Sofa Baton Hub, uh, similar to the uh, Sofa Baton U1, where you uh, point it directly at the front of the remote and learn things that way. This one, uh, the instructions are, you know, hold the original remote perpendicular to the top of that little hub and then hold down the button during the learning process and usually there's a little progress bar that goes across in the app to say yeah it's learning that command well i can tell you from experience sometimes the holding down results in the command just you know it it goes too many times or not enough there's weird things that happen there uh doing a single button press or two button presses usually doesn't work so I have found in a lot of them that getting it to learn the command from the original remote requires finding just the right rhythm of repeatedly (laughs) pressing the button, which is just pure trial and error. But you can kind of see the little progress bar on the app and it it, it actually kind of like bounces as you you press in rhythm. So if you find just the right rhythm, that little progress bar just goes up smoothly and then sometimes, sometimes it works. So uh, no promises there. The best thing to do is email them, honestly. It's just totally, totally ready for prime time. Yeah. This thing, he if he doesn't use the remote for a while, it seems to lose connection with the hub. Unplugging the hub and plugging it back in gets it working again, but obviously that's an annoyance. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's 
that's a deal breaker for most people, <laughs> to be honest with you. Yeah, but you I pick guess up the remote, you push a button, nothing happens until you unplug yeah. and replug. Yeah. Yeah. So we'd like to know if other users are experiencing the same issue. Rob's going to answer this one. I'm going to get some water. On that uh, community forum, because Sofa Baton, has, uh, uh, Sofa Baton has their own community forum, yes, other people have reported this issue. They have a response. Some people have said they've tried to do what Sofa Baton told them to do, and it still doesn't work. Uh, but their response to this is in the app that you use to set everything up, uh, go into the X1 settings. From there, go to the firmware update for X1 remote. And even if you have already done the firmware update just go through the process make sure that the hub and the remote both are fully up to date in the firmware after the update Sofa Baton says you, you, you need to change something you need to change something in the app change a button change an activity add a new device add a new activity like just make a change so that the hub will then update the remote. They say make sure to keep the hub and the remote physically close to one another uh, as the hub sends that updated information to the remote, but change something in the app, then have the hub do a new synchronization with the remote. And that's that's their advice. Uh, like I say, some people say they've tried that and it still doesn't work, but I bet a lot of people haven't actually done that second step. I bet a lot of people just say, yeah, I've done the firmware update. I've done the synchronize, the manual synchronize still doesn't work. They're like, no, nope, change something, get it to completely resynchronize the remote with the hub. And uh, the, that's, that's their best advice. That's all I got. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dale. Dale upgraded from a 5.2.2 configuration to a 5.2.4 by adding a pair of SVS Prime satellite speakers. He already had a pair of Mirage Omnipolar speakers mounted up high as front heights, and since the tweeters on those Mirage speakers basically fire straight up, he mounted those upside down. Mm -hmm. So when he installed the Prime satellites as top middles, he also turned them upside down, but was that the right thing to do? His ceiling is a little over 9 feet high, and both pairs of speakers are mounted high on the walls. I literally don't think it matters. <laughs> Like one yeah. iota. <laughs> I certainly don't think you've done any harm by having them upside no. down to the point that I wouldn't go through the hassle of taking them down and mm -hmm. flipping them over and putting them back up again. Uh, but I agree with Tom. I, I don't really like it's not a problem either way, to be honest, when it comes to the satellites. I, I, I think sonically it is an identical experience for you. Right. You could turn them sideways if you want. It makes you feel <laughs> better. I really don't think it matters. So he used Monoprice's uh, speaker wall mounts, which says that can support 22 pounds. The Prime satellites weigh about nine. But he's a little concerned about the plastic ball joint's ability to actually hold the speakers in place. He's used a little rubber nub to keep the bottom corner of each satellite uh, from touching the wall if it were to sag a little bit. It seems to be working okay, but should he replace uh, those Monoprice wall mounts? Um, no, I recommend these actually. Right. On our podcast. <laughs> yeah, I mean, on the, on the website. Uh, <clears throat> so yes, tightening these things down, uh, so that the ball, the, the upside of the ball joint is that you can orient it in any way you want. Right. And it gives you tons of flexibility, which is great. The downside is that you got to torque down that thing or the plastic yeah, sleeve around it. The wing thing that tightens down on the ball joint. Yeah, you gotta you gotta really jack that thing down. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I I like your little rubber nub. Yep, I quite like thing. what he's I, done. Honestly, all of it I, looks I think good. That looks good to me. I would not worry about this thing. I mean, now that it's touching that nub, it's not. I mean, if it, it's not gonna sag. If it yeah. does, it's gonna sag to the side or whatever, and you'll kind of notice it. But, um, yeah, I, I don't see any reason to do anything. No, with I'm I'm quite happy with you leaving things as they are. I will just mention for anyone else who's uh, worried about having a very secure wall or ceiling mount, or they have speakers that are heavier than the Prime satellites, because certainly some are. Uh, one of the mounts that I like to recommend is from Mount It. It is their MISBO3, going for $22 a pair, so they're not crazy overpriced or anything like that. These are a heavy-duty uh, wall mount rated for 32 pounds, and uh, they do not have the ball joint style. So... If you want to, like, uh, what would we be adjusting there? The roll? Adjusting the roll as opposed to just the pitch of the yaw? Because you can change the pitch of the yaw with these, but not so much the roll. Uh, you'd kind of have to do that with the with the stem of it itself or with the mount that actually secures to the speaker. That's where you would have to adjust the roll of the speaker on these ones. But one of the reasons I like the SBO3 from Mount It um, is that it is very secure. It has the additional little, like, steel um, string <laughs> type of thing that connects what... Um, right. 
right. the base of it to the part that actually connects to the speaker. So even if all of the joints in between fail, the thing is still not going to like completely fall down on somebody's head. So uh, I'm happy to recommend those, but I do not think that Dale needs to swap out for them. Just wanted to yeah, mention I don't it think for so anybody either. else. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think I've recommended those mounts too. Hmm. So when we use the term field of view, Dale still doesn't feel like he totally understands what we're referring to. Could we go over field of view again? In his case, he's seeing 11 feet from an 86 inch LG LCD TV. Hmm. It's too, sm- too small. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, Sempty so, would say it's fine. We'll, we'll get to that. If you, th- to, to understand field of view, it's actually a little bit easier than maybe we're making it sound for the most part because we're kind of assuming people know what it is and everything else. But if you just leave your eyes in one position, however much of your vision is taken up by the screen is your field of view. Sure. Okay. That is how how much it blocks everything else mm-hmm. that's out there. So, uh, you know, when we say a 45-degree field of view, it means that, you know, it takes up a 45-degree arc from your mm. eye. Yeah, one you know. other way you could think so, of it is if you're looking straight ahead, and we call mm-hmm. that zero degrees, right? Straight ahead is zero degrees. If we're talking about a 45-degree field of view, uh, we're talking left to right in that case. Yes. Left to right. So if z- straight ahead is zero degrees, then we're going to make an arc that goes 22 and a half degrees to the left and an arc that goes 22 and a half degrees to the right. So between so those two points is now 45 degrees. Everything within that, we've kind of drawn a triangle at this point. Everything inside of that 22 and a half degrees to the left, 22 and a half degrees to the and right, that's your field of view that we're talking about. We're not, yeah, we're not worried about height. Well, because that case. changes with the aspect yeah. ratio of whatever it is you're watching. That changes. Right. Yeah. So, but the height of it is never going to be taller than the width of it. Yeah, all of our aspect ratios. Well, unless we start watching, you know, TikTok videos on our yeah, screens. Yeah, but even then, then <laughs> e- even then, we'd have to have different screens. You know yes. what I mean? <laughs> they, they would not be but the same. If it was on the same screen, and, it would just take up the middle. Everything of it, television so, yeah. and movies is wider than it is tall. So, um, so therefore, we're not. We, we only talk about the width because that's the biggest dimension. Right. If the biggest dimension was height, we would worry about height. And sometimes, confusingly, width. you'll see the advice of sit X number of screen heights away from the screen and mm. i hate that advice because you know the, i actually have not seen that so i'm glad yeah, to know that that's out there for me to hate the on image is variable get... what's confusing is of course our television screen sizes are given to us in diagonals you yes. know it's given to us in what is the distance from the lower left corner to unless, the upper right corner <laughs> unless you're shopping at seymour av in right. which case they do give you the <laughs> horizontal they go by and the vertical yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so when we're working out our field of view when we talk about a 30 degree field of view or a 45 or a 50 whatever it is we're talking about the width of the screen not the diagonal so that can be confusing so in your case he's like i have an 86 inch tv well that means it is 86 inches diagonal and in fact it's an 86 inch class so if you measured it with a tape measure it's 85.6 inches from the lower left corner to the upper right corner or the upper left corner to the lower right corner that diagonal across his screen is 85.6 inches so if we just work out what the actual width of your television is, uh, then we can say, okay, if we're 11 feet away, we can just use a little trigonometry, right? We can say that the distance from your eyes to the screen, that's one side of the triangle. Uh, The right angle to that would be half of the width of your television. And now we work out what is the angle? What is the tangent, right? Opposite over adjacent. We work out what is the tangent. So in your case, sitting 11 feet from your 85.6 inch diagonal screen gives you a field of view that is 31.56 degrees. So you've got- Which is Sempty. It's a small end. That's of right. Sempty, you're, you're on the, you're on, you're right within Sempty's guidelines for HD TV. They want a 30 degree field of view, 15 degrees to the left and right of center. That's what you got. You're a little bit more than that. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's where your field of view is. And I don't know. Hopefully that explains what field of view is overall. Infinite Gary. Gary has decided to try out a rhythmic sealed sub. It's for his small exercise room. So he's going with one of their F12 models, which is, by rhythmic standards, a small sealed sub, if I remember correctly. <laughs> That's right. They've got a bunch of different amplifier options. The least expensive is the F12400, which uses a 400-watt Hypex Class D amp. It 
has two channel RCA and LFE inputs and a single band of parametric EQ. The XLR amp is the default model, but it costs $250 more. As the name implies, it has XLR inputs and it's class AB and it also has a greater number of extension setting options. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Finally, there's the PEQ amp. It costs $80 more than the XLR option. So that's up to $330 mm -hmm. more than the standard, than the, the class cheapest one. one. Yep. And instead of RCA and XLR, it has RCA and speaker level inputs, still just a single ba band of parametric EQ. So maybe that PEQ is a little a little bit yeah. misleading. <laughs> yeah. misleading. He wrote to Rhythmic to ask about any performance differences, and they replied that uh, in the default extension settings, they all perform the same. Gary is fine with the basic finish options. Uh, so is there any reason for him to spend more than the F12400? He'll be using the left and right pre-out RCA connections from his... Luxman integrated amp to feed the sub. So maybe those additional extension settings, I still don't know what those extension settings are. So but, what um, what they have in the F12400, it has what I consider to be the, th the three most reasonable variable extension options. One is just the standard output we would expect from a sealed subwoofer. It starts to roll off at about 30 to 35 hertz and does so at a 12 decibel per octave slope. That's what we'd expect from a, from a sealed subwoofer. Extension option number two in the F12400 uh, basically artificially boosts the low end output so that it's pretty darn flat down to right about 22 hertz and then rolls off much more steeply. Uh, similar to what we would expect a ported sub to look like, except that it's doing that by boosting the output in the low base and then adding an additional filter so that it uh, um, rolls off on the bottom end much more steeply than just a regular sealed sub would. And the third output extension option on the F12400 is like maximum output mode, where it basically plays uh, pretty flat down to about 30 hertz and then rolls off very steeply below that. So it's just maximum output at about 30 hertz and above. So th those are sort of the three that make the most sense to me. Uh, the uh, XLR version and the PEQ version, they give you a choice of three different corner frequencies. So I think it's 28 hertz, 20 hertz, and 14 hertz for some ridiculous reason. And then three different slopes. So you've got every permutation of these three different corner frequencies and three different slopes that you could possibly apply to it. I see that as potentially getting someone in some trouble because if they yeah. set it to 14 hertz with minimal slope, they're going to end up bottoming out that subwoofer as they try to make it play flat down to 14 hertz with like no roll off below that. I, 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 I don't see that as actually a safe option. Uh, mm. So I don't see any reason why you need all the different permutations um, of, of those yeah. things. I, I think the so, three that are available in the F12400 are exactly the three that I would want. In fact, I just want the default slope. That's all I want yeah. is the 12 decibel per octave roll off with the 20 hertz extension. Well, it's got two channel RCA inputs. It's got an That's LFE all it input. Needs. It's all you need. Uh, the, I, this is a small exercise room. There's no reason why 400 watts isn't going to be able to push this thing exactly as, you know, as hard as it needs to, mm -hmm. to get down to 20 hertz. So... Yeah, I don't know, man. I, I don't oh, I just wanted to mention it for other people. Like, if they get yeah. confused about those extension options, like, don't. I wouldn't change from the default, frankly. Just leave it alone. <laughs> yeah. It, it makes sense from a business standpoint to give people as yes. many options as possible, especially three, because I'll usually buy the middle The middle one, one sure. You know, so they don't want to buy the, the cheapest one because they feel like they're going to be missing out on something. <laughs> but they don't want to pay for the most expensive one because it's the most expensive. But mainly, so it gives you three different input options. One RCA only, one XLR, one speaker level inputs. That's the main mm -hmm. reason to choose one of the different right. three. Right. Yeah, I would leave it. I would leave the 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 sub as default setting. Yep. Gary came across a post on ABS forum from the owner of Rhythmic Audio. He was saying to take the size of woofers in your front left and right speakers into consideration when deciding which size of subwoofer to get he seemed to indicate that if your front speakers have woofers larger than six and a half you ought to step up to a 15 inch subwoofer model and only use a 12 inch sub if your front sp uh, speaker woofers are six and a half or smaller this was a new take any thoughts we disagree <laughs> i mean i i i can okay, see where this so came from but i disagree I, I, I understand what the thought process here yeah. is and it is it is this it is if you're it, it, can we make some assumptions on your speaker's performance based on the size of the woofers and 
in the extension and, and, and stuff like that. And if we make those assumptions, does that also then translate into maybe making some general guidelines about what size of subwoofer to buy, especially if you buy it from me? <laughs> Right. And I can see where all these things came into play, but the reality is, is it doesn't make a dang bit of difference. What the, matters the is the size, size of your room. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, well, the, heck, what, the size of the room this, determines SPS that. SPS has this too in their itself. Merlin tool, though, as well, right? They ask yeah, you what yeah. speakers you have and recommend a subwoofer based on what speakers you have. And I'm like, I don't care what speakers you have. I care about what room you have. Um, so this is like, it's basically an, an older way of thinking. It was a very common way of thinking. It's a continuing way of thinking for a lot of people about subwoofers, yeah. which is they essentially work from top-down thinking, right? They're still under the quote-unquote ideal to a lot of people would be your speakers playing completely full range on their own. Uh, but since most don't, we're going to add a subwoofer to handle the lowest octave or two. But we still want our speakers to play as low as they possibly can. So we're going to look at the minus 3 dB roll-off point of the speakers and set our subwoofer to cross over there. Regardless of what's happening in the room, we're just going to look at the extension of the speakers. So the, there's some assumption going on here that if you have larger woofers than 6.5 inch, yeah. some 8 inch woofers or 10 inch woofers, they probably play uh, the speakers, have an extension down to 45, 40 hertz or something. Something right. like that. So like, well, if you, all you need is that one lowest octave and you've already got 10 inch drivers, we're going to assume that those can play fairly loud. Then let's get the big old 15 inch driver that can, you know, play loud and play that lowest octave. Yeah, I get where the thinking came from. Tom and I work bottom up. We don't work top down. We worry what's the room. Let's get the subwoofers correct for the room. Now we've laid the foundation and we can use essentially whatever speakers we, we want as long as those speakers have enough output for the distance that you're seating from them. That's now yeah. all we care about. Uh, we care about working bottom up. So I can see where they came from. We disagree with it. That's my thought. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's... It's the same thing that, that happens on this podcast all the time because we answer specific questions with specific answers. Mm -hmm. What we don't generally do is give general answers to general questions. Mm -hmm. It's just not something that happens because there's very few generalities that really work. You know, the the size of the subwoofer, the placement of the subwoofer based on the room and and the size, the shape of the room, those are kind of general general uh, advice that we can give that are pretty universal, but not always, you know. Uh, so what he was trying to do, or she, I don't really know who wants to It's a he. Uh, was trying to do was say, okay, you know, if I had, if you had to, I, I mean, I didn't read the thing, mm -hmm. so I don't know. But, you know, given these the, these parameters, how would I say you should shop for our, our subs? This is what this would sure. be the advice. I don't think that it's universal. I don't think that it's a good way to do it. And frankly, um, the last thing I need is people saying I have a six and a half inch woofer in my right. bookshelf. Do I get a 15 or a 12 inch subwoofer? Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I just don't care. Bertrand in Quebec. Bertrand's blacked out theaters over a year old now. He's grateful for our help along the way. He'd like to share some thoughts since they might be helpful to others. And if you are on the Do you want to YouTube... swap back and forth on these since there's so many? So that way you're not well, reading I... all of it in one row? Holy moly, that's a whole lot, isn't it? <laughs> it's his thoughts. That's, that's fine. Uh, so you went with the Valencia Theater recliners. He wished he had just gotten a love seat or couch instead. So one point for Tom. That was me. Saying that I think that uh, it's on the AV gadgets too. Individual theater uh, recliners. You don't like them. <laughs> I don't like recliners. All right. Go ahead. Uh, he worked out his uh, seating distance to provide exactly a 45 degree field of view with his 77 inch OLED. He wouldn't mind if the field of view were a bit larger. Yes, that's that's a common oh. thing. That's all right. Okay. It's not necessarily going to be true for everybody. So uh, we still like the advice. Go to the movie theater, figure out where it is that you like to sit and we can sort of glean what I, sort of a field of view we should get from that. I, I feel bad saying that in the midst of an ongoing pandemic right. to tell people to go to the movie theaters when, yeah, but yes, that is sort of the way to do it. So he went with Towers, the Martin Logan Motion Series. There, one reason he doesn't feel comfortable moving his seats any closer to TV. So he's considering a switch to a bookshelf 
fronts. So two points for me. Mm -hmm. uh, the black levels from his OLED have made it difficult to accept anything less now. He pre-wired his home theater for potentially adding a projector in the future, but he doesn't know if that's ever going to happen now that he's used to an OLED. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel <laughs> exactly I know what you're talking about. Even when I switch to a very good LCD, I'm like, still not an OLED. Uh, where is those bookshelves, towers? I'm, I'm putting links in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, a completely blacked out room with all the walls and ceiling painted black is the best. So minus one point for me. So I don't, yeah, that's fine. Whatever. The, the, if you're not looking at the, the Flickr album mm -hmm. or whatever, then just and close your eyes. Even if you are, that's what, yeah, there's a whole lot of black there. Uh, there's he, a whole lot of black. He built this whole room using sound clips and hat channels and double five eighths inch drywall. Uh, he believes those soundproofing efforts have worked out great. He can listen at full reference volume without waking up his wife and kids. Although, if it's a movie with sustained super loud bass, for example, Christopher Nolan's movies with those Hans Zimmer soundtracks, uh, those might still bother somebody late at night. So he followed our advice and got a pair of SB1000 Pro subs. A part of him still thinks he should have gone for the dual SB2000 Pros instead. FOMO? Yeah, you might have FOMO, but you fo wrong. So, yeah, you'll be fine with those. You're able to play those. movies, Christopher Nolan movies, that still wake yeah, up Yeah, I know, your really. Kids. Who's complaining? <laughs> I, Apparently, I, you've I got could, enough I can overblow my soundproofed, blacked-out right. home theater, but, boy, I wish I had bigger subs so I could turn them up less loud. <laughs> so he kept everything uh, surface-mounted, uh, rail lighting on the ceiling rather than recessed lighting, on-ceiling speakers instead of in-ceiling. Uh, he is certain that was a good choice for his soundproofing. Probably for soundproofing, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, we suggested shelves to hold his surround speakers, but he went with speaker stands instead. That gave him more freedom to play with the exact placement, and that turned out to be a good choice on his part. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I, I, would, I wouldn't have had a problem with that. Uh, he had his finished carpenter install the baseboard a little bit higher than they normally would have, and that allowed him to easily tuck his speaker wires underneath without pinching anything. So he highly recommends that if you're having someone finish the room for you or doing it yourself. There you go. He was very concerned about minimizing any and all openings in this room, so he left the air register for his uh, for his HVAC, but he did not install a re air return, and the door is sealed. He only closes the door to watch a single movie at a time, so he hasn't noticed any sort of problem with that yet. He isn't sure what to check, though, as far as what could go wrong with having an air inlet but no air return. Well, first of all, it should get hot, and second of all, I mean, you're not going to pass out. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, yeah, if you're opening it up after two hours, you'll be okay, especially yeah. if you're in there by yourself. Um, it's just going to get hot. It, it's not, uh, like some people are going to say, okay, you could end up with a back pressure in your HVAC system, but it's not that different from just closing the register in a room, which, you know, you can do on any people do. You know, almost yeah. normal any uh, register. You can close a register. So it's it's not like... You're doing it two hours at a time. It's not going to break anything. So I'm not super duper concerned about it. Just, yeah, if you actually did fill up this theater, maybe you had more than three people in there, uh, it would probably get hot in like a three-hour movie. Yeah. Uh, isn't it oh, you? is it me? Yes. Uh, where are we? Are we on this one, the, the APC? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, he followed our advice. He has all of his gear plugged into an APC battery backup. He isn't sure that it's actually useful. Maybe he could have saved some money there. Yeah, if you're in a place that's got very, very stable power and you never have brownouts or blackouts, then you're not going to notice your battery backup doing much. So I will fully admit where I live, I have fairly frequent, uh, short, uh, like I say, lots of construction. So I notice it all the time and super duper appreciate it. It's a... You're happy if you ever need it. <laughs> that's what. That's the. But you don't. One yeah, instance. it's one of those things that you don't notice. Like no, no, we have until you need it. Uh, my Panamax is dying, and I, I yeah. just got into IO gear uh, last week, and I haven't had a chance to take it out of the box or take any pictures of it or get it set up or anything like that. But I am super excited because the Panamax is just not cutting it. It, it's, right. it the the batteries are basically dead, and they need it needs to be it needs to be done away with. But the uh, believe me. It seems like I, I have no f power fluctuations, no problems at all, except between 9 and 10 p.m., mm. there's always one. <laughs> and it usually happens right in the middle of us watching something like Miss Marvel mm -hmm. or, uh, or Obi-Wan together as a family. And my wife looks at me like, you have failed me again as mm. a husband. I'm like, I know. I'll do it. So it's like you can live without insurance I until you need the insurance. You don't need it. And you're like, why am I paying for this insurance? And, and then you need the insurance. So right. I think if you've spent the money on an APC battery backup, which is not ridiculous amounts of money, then one day it's going to kick in. And you're like, oh, that's why I have it. Yeah. That's right. 
Uh, let's see, is it Tom's turn? So he didn't <laughs> quite know what he was in for when it comes to noticing every little flaw in movies. Now it took some time to realize uh, the content itself can vary a lot in quality, even within a single movie. Uh, watch the Judge Dredd movie, the mm-hmm. Dredd movie, just Dredd. If you want to watch video quality change <laughs> horrendously between scenes, <laughs> some of those things I was like... I don't think they meant to leave this in the movie, but they were stuck with it. So at first he kept thinking his system needed adjusting to make everything look and sound nice, but now he wants all the content makers to up their game. <laughs> like, I know, man, it happens. Yep, you've, you've tuned your system nicely. That's why you can start evaluating the content itself now rather than what you're watching it on. So he's watched 78 movies in the past 365 days. Yes, he keeps a list, so that's an exact number. <laughs> and the last thing he has to do is to get his DIY corner base traps made and installs. So hopefully done this summer. So that's all his stuff. That's right. Hopefully that helps somebody else. He wanted to share the experience. We're happy to do so because we followed along with the building of this theater the whole way through. So congratulations. Glad it's very nearly complete. And you know what? I I think it's not worth it to paint your home theater black. I'm not <laughs> saying that it doesn't do anything. I say it's not worth it. It's not the same thing. But And I'm I apparently got no it. points up or down. I had no input I know, on this whole what's theater. Up with that? Only Tom had any contribution. I was the only one. Thanks, Bertrand. I guess he knows that there's somebody's ego that needs to be stroked around here, and it's not yours. <laughs> so <laughs> he's noticed that on his uh, LG CX OLED Ultra HD Blu-rays, as played by his Panasonic UBA20, seem to look nicer in general, just in HDR10 than in Dolby Vision. Are there settings he needs to adjust? Are the two HDR formats configured separately? The two HDR formats are indeed configured separately. Um, so... What I can basically say is Dolby Vision, I think it's listed as cinema in the C10. It might be listed as Dolby Vision Dark. Uh, But there's basically a Dolby Vision Home, that's the brighter version, and then a Dolby Vision Dark or a Dolby Vision Cinema, uh, that's the darker version. Now, in your completely blacked out theater, you should definitely be using Dolby Vision Dark or Dolby Vision Cinema, however it's labeled, because that is the actual, like, as accurate as it can possibly be. Now, the thing is, HDR tends to look much dimmer than people expect it to. You're going to be able to see all the detail because you're watching an OLED in a completely blacked out room. But sure. that is the correct way that it's supposed to look if you're in Dolby Vision Dark mode. And you basically don't need to touch anything else on your C10 OLED. You put it in Dolby Vision Dark mode and you can feel confident that you are seeing exactly the number of nits that the signal said to play until you get to where the OLED can't get as bright as the signal asked and then it's tone mapping, but doing so correctly. HDR10, I suspect the reason it's looking more uh, pleasing is that it's very easy to make HDR10 look brighter than Dolby Vision. Mm-hmm. Um, you could try the Dolby Vision home mode, but that does tend to lose some of the details because it's just brightening everything up. Uh, there's two things that can be going on with HDR10. One, uh, if you've actually followed my advice and turned on dynamic tone mapping, I will have to warn you, that is no longer accurate. <laughs> I like what dynamic tone mapping does. I prefer the way it looks. It's why I'm not worried about having Dolby Vision. But it, as Vincent Teal would tell you, is not accurate to the signal. It's brighter in the shadows. You can see the shadow detail more easily with dynamic tone mapping turned on. And it does a very good job of retaining the highlights, which is what I want most. I don't want to lose highlights. And I'm willing to have some brightened shadows because I don't mind seeing more detail in the shadows. But it is not strictly accurate. So if what you've mainly noticed is that HDR10 in general looks brighter than Dolby Vision, wouldn't be a surprise at all if you're in dynamic HDR mode. Uh, The UB820 also has its HDR optimizer. So if you want... HDR10 to look as close to Dolby Vision dark as it can, you can use that HDR optimizer. I usually say with an OLED, don't bother because why tone map twice? But Mm. if you want to turn on the HDR optimizer in your UB820, that's going to make sure you don't lose any highlight detail. Then turn off dynamic tone mapping in your LG OLED, and now the two should look more comparable. I bet you have dynamic tone mapping turned on because I I told you to. (laughs) I recommended it. So if there, that maybe that's a minus point for me is that you followed that advice and you're like, wait a second, they don't look the same. Done with that. You better give Rob some points. <laughs> In his living room, he's got an older Sony STR DH820. He likes that number 820. Mm. AV receiver powering just one pair of speakers that started having problems. First, the left speaker started cutting out. He swapped the speaker for a different one and knows it works fine. 
that he knows works fine. Mm -hmm. And it also cut out. So he's pretty sure it's the receiver's left output. Then recently it went into protection mode. So is it time to replace it? Or could he somehow use a different pair of binding posts, like memory surround back binding posts, to power his pair of speakers instead of the front, left, and right outputs? Um, you check the speaker wire, though, right? Like you... you you double, we're gonna, triple check the speaker wire. We're going right? to hope because this <laughs> wouldn't surprise me at all if the speaker wire actually is fine and it's just some dust, maybe spider yeah. web, whatever, inside or on the binding post outside, yeah. either on the speaker itself, probably not since he swapped it out. So on the binding post of the AV receiver or inside the AV receiver, because he's been using this AV receiver for a long time. The idea that well, there's a little bit of dust bunny in there or a little bit, one strand of spider silk that you would never in a million years see just looking for it has accumulated across the inside <laughs> of the AV receiver binding post well within the realm of possibility. So I would just say, get some compressed air and a vacuum cleaner, blow the thing out, get it cleaned yeah, up. I'll bet that's sure. all you need to do. If That's what this sounds like. It does not sound like yeah. the amplifier channel going because the amplifier channel going sounds like nothing. Right. <laughs> it just goes. Right, right, right. It doesn't like cut, cut, cut in out. and out. Yeah. So, yeah. And going into protection mode could easily be that. Now, if somehow it is just the left channel amplifier is gone for some reason, yet there is the ability in that model of Sony to have uh, speaker A and speaker B. And speaker B uses the surround back binding posts exactly like you sort of alluded to. So to get that in there, you go into the speaker settings. You have to go to the surround back assign. They call it SB assign. And set that to speaker B instead of surround back. You can also set it to zone two. So there's the three options there. So you have to assign it as speaker B. Then on the front panel, the physical front panel of the Sony, uh, on the far left, there's a button that just says speakers. <laughs> and you push that until it says speakers B instead of speakers A. And yeah. now the front left and right channels will come out of the surround back binding post. So you, there is that option. So RSS is very long. We might get through the first section. That's what I kind of hope to, because that's what he's hoping to get on, because uh, they found a house, so... Let, let's see what how much we can do. We'll uh -oh. stop when we need to. All right, Aras. They found the house they really like. I mean, again, he's the one who's been planning his home theater for a house he doesn't That's right. own <laughs> yet. I kept telling them, buy your stupid house before you talk to me about your stupid home theater. Anyways, <laughs> uh, with a room that looks like it will work nicely as a home theater. Uh, their offer has been accepted pending inspection and appraisal, so fingers crossed. He's got lots more questions. The images of the proposed theater, the proposed theater room, are taken from the Zillow listing, so he apologizes that I don't show every angle, but they'll hopefully give a rough idea. The dimensions are roughly 15 by 20, uh, and apparently it opens up to the whole rest of the house. We'll get into that. Yeah, the description yeah. is below. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, would we believe he isn't going to have as much money to spend on the theater as he originally hoped and planned? Uh, yeah, yeah, I would believe it because I said it. <laughs> right. So closing costs, <laughs> higher interest rates, higher monthly payment, it all means less money for the theater. So let's work our way through what to do with this proposed room. He's got the two uh, battling sides of wanting to isolate the theater room and soundproof it as much as possible and wanting to spend as little as possible and change as little as possible at the existing room. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Gunn close off my home theater in my living room. And spend 9,000 extra dollars on a projector. I bet that one's not happening anymore. Yeah. Yeah. The kids' bedrooms are directly above this theater. Oh, my God. Mm. Let me tell you something about your kids. They ain't going to wake up for nothing. <laughs> I, I'm going to be honest with you. My wife and, and every every parent I know is terrified that their children are going to wake up mm. constantly. And I'm sure there's kids out there who do ha sleep very lightly. I have not met any of them. Once those kids asleep, they asleep. You could pick them up, you could throw them in the car, you could drive them across the state lines and take them out of the car, put them in a different bed, they would have no idea. So I know that you're concerned about your kids being up there, but I'm telling you that's your wife's the one that's going to wake up. The kids' bedrooms are directly above the theater room, and as we can see from the pictures, it's a fireplace on what will almost certainly be a, the front wall, and it's actually a wood-burning fireplace with a chimney that goes up through the floor above and out uh, the roof, a double door that leads outside uh, in the rear left, doors on the right that lead into a utility room and a bathroom, and openings at the back into the kitchen into the stairway. You ain't closing this off, yeah. by the way. Okay, <laughs> it's not happening. He is open to the idea of building a wall to close off. No, you're not. I'll close off that <laughs> opening to the kitchen and also install a door at either the top or bottom of the stairway. As far as HVAC concerns go, there's an air return on the right wall that goes straight from the, this theater room to the utility room and air registers in the ceiling of the theater room. So it seems like the 
theater itself should be fine for getting air in and out, right? But should he still consult an HVAC specialist? You are not closing off this room. Uh, <laughs> that's Tom's answer. <laughs> uh, I, dude, my dude, you're going to take your kitchen and shrink it in half. This is not what's happening. Huh? Here. I mean, it's in the kitchen, right? Or is it no, downstairs? No, no, no. It's, in the it's down. So, okay. So it's a little bit tough to see in the uh, the third photo. Uh, oh, but, I so see now. There's okay. stairs going up. So it's kind of like the the kitchen is almost in a half floor. It's like a sunken room that has the fireplace in it. So if we're looking at the kitchen photo, there's like the door that comes into the kitchen, then there's a railing and an opening, and then like a half floor down is this room that we're looking at. Because you can see that the double doors going outside are like a half a floor lower than the kitchen. Then to the right of the stairs that are going up, those are the stairs going down. We can see a little bit of the fireplace peeking next to like the cabinets next to the stove. So there's two openings from this kitchen down to this sort of sunken oh, room. I see it. Yeah, yeah okay. there's the stairway going down that doesn't have a door on the top of the bottom, uh, and then there's this like railing and an opening uh, between there. So, I yeah. So maybe maybe Tom's opinion changes a little bit. It's it's like it could be physically possible to close off I this don't room. See where you're gonna put that door at the bottom of those stairs. It's gonna open into the. It's either yeah yeah it would be awkward uh, to have it at the bottom for sure because it yeah would... it can't be at the top I don't think because it's gonna that that's even worse I think it's hard it's hard to see where these stairs yeah I mean it would be like a little bit abnormally tall construction at the top there and it looks as though your smoke detector is inside the opening and so you'd have to move oh, the smoke that's, detector that's easy to move. that's easy that's enough easy. it also has the thermostat right there though that would be a little bit tougher to move the thermostat because then if you close that it's off, of, it's only going to be yeah. sensing what's, well, not only, but it's mainly going to be sensing what's downstairs and not what's upstairs. So do you need to consult, uh, consult an HVAC specialist if you're planning to close this room off? Yes, you do. Yes, you yeah. do. Uh, that doesn't necessarily have to cost money or a lot of money. It's a consultation. It's an estimate. Uh, but definitely talk to them because I suspect that much of the heating and cooling that goes into the kitchen, the path for air return back to the furnace is just the opening into this room that has this obvious grate that goes into the utility room in case you close that door. I don't know if the kitchen and whatever the kitchen is open to has a dedicated air return of its own. It's probably just passive, re- passively relying on the opening into that right. proposed theater room. So definitely consult an HVAC specialist still if we're going to consider the idea of actually closing this room off. All right. I, I don't see how you close this room off. I mean, I, I think easiest. it might be possible. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, I, well, I think anything's the, possible if you throw enough money and time at it. You could right. rebuild the whole house. Totally possible. It almost seems like you would take and build another wall in, you know, like if you're coming down the stairs, mm-hmm. you walk, you would have to walk past that bathroom and then there would be a wall in front of you there that you would oh, open the door and go into the bathroom. the whole theater. room. Yeah, that's the only way that really makes sense to me. It would still be strange, but uh, that's the only way that really that makes would, sense That to would me. have uh, each vac concerns uh, for sure. As well. Yeah, it's yeah. like, yeah, there's this sort of little extra area where the double doors are because um, it's not a perfect rectangle, right? There's a little bit of a thing past, like there's the closet that's under the stairs that are going upstairs and then the little section that goes back to where the opening to the kitchen is and the, and the double doors. It's like... Could we close off that that section by cutting across? That would be an HVAC thing for sure. Um, But not the end of the world because it is still open to the kitchen. So there's possibilities, but I would definitely consult an HVAC specialist. So leaving the room open would mean that if he wants a fully pressurized base in the theater, he'd wind up basically trying to pressurize the entire house, right? Yeah. Is there any alternative to building a wall and installing a door? Maybe could thick curtains be enough? Stop. Stop. Recommend. (laughs) Stop. Ask. Stop. That's never the answer. How thick are these? Sure. Lead line curtains that are sealed to the top and bottom and do not ever move or open. Yeah. The the, commercial. Or as as, as we like to call it, a wall. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) A a, a semi-movable wall. Uh, Yeah. The the two-inch thick uh, mass-loaded vinyl lead lined uh, 
quote unquote curtains fully sealed around every edge and perimeter uh, could accomplish what a wall <laughs> would accomplish. Uh, I don't really think that's what you have in mind. I, I think he's thinking about something that, you know, uh, is movable and air yeah. permeable. And here is the key. If it is air permeable, it is not soundproof. Simple as that's that. Right. So yes, the doors uh, to the utility room and bathroom need to be replaced right away with solid corridors. The utility room does have drywall on both sides of that party wall. So for the sake of budget, is there a less expensive option that would still keep the sound of the furnace from making its way into the theater and vice versa? I mean, it's Boy, coming through got, that air return. So <laughs> you got, yeah, you got a lot of lot of things. And that the 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 whether or not the doors are solid core is like mm. number seven hundred on the list of things I'm going to worry about in this room. You got bigger problems, bigger fish to fry here. Um, I wouldn't worry about that. Like Rob said, the 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 direct path is through the air vents. Yeah, essentially. So worrying about whether or not there's a solid core door there is uh, is putting the cart way before the horse. Indeed. So so what should be done if anything about the fireplace? Should he wall it off? Build a false wall in front of it to hold his projection screen? Something else. Well, you should definitely put your TV on top of it because everybody loves that. <laughs> and then post it to Reddit and talk about how much you love it. Okay. I mean, me, one. I'm thinking, hey, retractable screen. Retractable screen ceiling mounted absolutely makes sense in this scenario. It does not have to cost an enormous leg. It does not have to be acoustically transparent. So we can do yeah. this quite affordably. Um, yeah, I don't like the, I mean, certainly unless you're going to bring in a fireplace specialist and it is not super cheap to just completely close off a wood burning fireplace. I'm not a big fan of that idea. Putting a false wall in front of that is definitely a no. I mean, first of all, I'm just looking at where the door is placed for that utility room and yeah. obviously it couldn't go all the way across. And then no, we do not want an obstruction between the fireplace and and everyone else, even if it's you know not actually drywall, we're, we're not gonna do that. So I would definitely lean towards a retractable screen that's mounted to the ceiling. So if projection screen is definitely the way you're going to go oh, in yeah, here, yeah. which you know we we don't know for sure. Oh, he's pretty sure. Now that now that we're you've got a room, you might your viewing angles might get to the point where you're like, well, let's just you know get a big old OLED <laughs> and call it good. Um, yeah, the 83 inches yeah. they got down to four thousand dollars for the C1 for the 83 inch C1, four thousand dollars. That ain't bad for that we, size. You know, you're going to need to do this in steps. Okay. Mm. And yes, the first thing you want to do is decide if you're going to make any structural changes to the room. And uh, that's where we're at right now. Yeah. Worrying about screens and everything else is, is it's not time. You got to figure out what you're going to do about if you're going to close the room off or not. Mm. Uh, like I think if I you can, are, you have to do that first. I, and then that will determine where your seats can be. And then that will determine your screen size. Right. And that will determine everything else. Yeah. I, I think I can size, greatly simplify this for you, Aris, which is. Like he's envisioning he's never had a completely dedicated theater that he can blast at full reference volume day or night, not bother anybody. And that's the dream. And I get that because we all want that. <laughs> that's why we want like the unfinished basement that we can completely, you know, do to our specs. To get to that point, Aris, there, you can't do half measures. You can't do, oh, I replaced yeah. this door and it got so much better. Like you would have to take down what's there build all new framing inside of what's there room within a room is what we're talking about you know the, yeah. the interior is complete like you would be stripping this like which he had in mind he was like originally i was going to like gut whatever i had now he knows he doesn't have the budget to do that so i would recommend not trying to do half measures that's not going to make you happy in the end basically my shorthand for this is we're going to live with this room. You are not going to be able to fully pressurize it for the time that it exists like this until you can gut it and redo it. Then just save what money you have. Like I, I'm going to tell you, dude, the minute you put, you put equipment in here, yeah. you might as well kiss making structural changes to this room goodbye <laughs> because it is, it is such a pain in the butt to get everything right, back out again. Right. It is a massive undertaking. So I'm going to say you need to make a decision about any structural changes you're going to make. Now, like Rob said about soundproofing, oh, we haven't gotten to that yet, I don't think. Anyways, yeah, we can get to um, that when we, yeah. We'll get now, to that Now, actually, it's this but question. <laughs> it's the next question, I know. So, you know, 
once you have decided what you're going to do with this room, that is what you're going to do mm. to it. And that mm. and, and that's it. And if that means that your entire budget is sucked up by structural changes to the room and changing the HVAC and rerunning mm-hmm. lines and everything mm-hmm. else, well, then that's what it is. And then you start saying, okay, now I'm going to set up whatever speakers I have. Yep. I mean, here, has however, fantastic speakers, so that's not a problem. Yeah, however however I can, and then that's where I'll, this is how I'll live with it. He already has an OLED, so it's not as though you're watching something yeah. horrible. It's just smaller than you originally wanted. Yeah, and then you'll slowly build yourself up from there. Or, you know, you may make say, I can't make any structural changes because mm. none of it makes sense, and then you can start thinking about all the other stuff you can do. Uh, yeah, close off the fireplace, I think, is... I don't mind the retractable screen. Mm-hmm. I think that's fine. Uh, I don't see any reason to do it. Like I said, it, it, like Rob said, a false wall seems. Oh, ugh. I don't. You like gotta it at have all some way. Here. You gotta have some way to get in and out so you can get to that that uh, that room back there. Number now one, you're talking and about two, like moving the door to the utility room so that you can have like a walk through from the utility room to in behind the false wall or something. Like it's, just, it's getting nuts. I know. I know that before we go on, I know that you're looking at this and going, "This is this is the space we have for a home theater." Mm-hmm. Are you sure? <laughs> is, yeah, did you use a bedroom? <laughs> is there no other place? And like you're like, "Oh, I can't put it in this room because it's too small." Put reconsider, <laughs> reconsider that because working with an existing room that's already a room will be much more what you want even right. if you guys have to like what if you sit very close to each other what if you repurpose this room this downstairs room as the master bedroom and the master bedroom becomes the theater upstairs i mean i'm betting your wife isn't on board with that idea but it's no, that, that sort of thing that's a terrible <laughs> idea but yeah but you know don't uh if there is another space in this house that you mm. think is too small for a home theater Infinite Gary will tell you you can put a home theater in any room, mm. uh, and he has. Mm-hmm. Let's let's maybe reconsider. So last, not I mean not lastly. I don't know how many no, we'll, questions we'll, he has. We'll get up to the subwoofer questions, and that'll be it. <laughs> he had originally envisioned gutting the room and fully soundproofing it, but now he wants to leave the room as alone as much as possible. However, with the bedrooms directly above, he's thinking he should focus on beefing up the ceiling. And this goes to Rob's: you can't do half measures. Yeah. He was thinking he'd leave the existing ceiling in place, but then install sound clips and hat channels and two layers of drywall directly beneath it. Would that work? And allow him to blast the sound in the theater without waking up anyone upstairs. His The bedrooms are fully carpeted, so hoping that will also help in terms of reducing any footfall noise getting into the theater. Well, that won't hurt. The footfall sure. noise yeah, won't hurt. Absolutely. Depends on the pad underneath and everything else, but you're still going to hear people up there. It's, I mean, unless it's and just really good. beefing up the ceiling, unfortunately, doesn't do yeah. what you want to do. Uh, you've got all these other flanking paths you've got the hvac system you've got the fireplace i mean this is why he was asking about it all but this is why i was like unfortunately when it comes to soundproofing and want to do full reference volume and not wake anybody up it's kind of an all or nothing that i I mean i wish i had better news but we'd be giving you bad advice like this happens all the time right you talk to contractors and they're like here's what we propose to the clients and they're like that's too expensive let's walk it back and they're like well here's the one step down and they're like let's walk it back some more and they're like well now you're just not getting what you wanted anymore like there's a point where you're now you're spending some extra money not getting what you wanted now everybody's upset (laughs) whereas it's like if you just completely leave it alone you know going in you're not getting what you wanted but you didn't spend any extra money or you just do it you do it full hog and then you get what you want but it costs you more than you have or want unfortunately trying to thread that needle and get something in between it just doesn't end up in good results i did want to mention specifically though you never want to leave the existing ceiling in place hang another ceiling right below it like if we're talking about a t-bar ceiling that's okay because we can insulate above that and it's air permeable but when you're talking about hanging additional layers of drywall below an existing layer of drywall you never want to do that there's actually an article i'll link to over at soundproofing company that is called the triple leaf effect it makes things worse unintuitively (laughs) than better because you end up with a resonance frequency that's four times the little gap that you just created, which puts it right in the vocal range. <laughs> and it's a horrible thing that happens because you, you can't really ameliorate that when you do it. It would be a terrible idea to leave the ceiling in place and then suspend more drywall below the existing ceiling. 
You could take away the ceiling that's there. I have to warn you, every time you open up an existing house's walls or ceiling, you are required by code to bring it up to code if it isn't already up to standard code, current right. code. And you almost never get away with that. There's something in the electrical or the HVAC or the plumbing that was fine when it was built, but modern code has updated something and you are now required by code to bring it up to code. So opening, I, that's probably why you didn't want to open the ceiling. I get you, yeah. but that's a bad idea. So I don't think you should do anything <laughs> until you can fully gut this room and do what you originally wanted to do. If you try to beef up that ceiling, it would be laminating with green glue a second layer of drywall to the existing ceiling. That would be the thing to do, not suspend anything below it. But that is still not going to have the full effect that you want because you have flanking paths. So I think that's that's about where I'll leave that one. So he has four KEF in ceiling speakers on hand, as well as a pair of KEF in wall speakers that he wants to use as surrounds. But since the left wall is an exterior wall, he isn't sure there's enough depth behind the drywall to install an in wall surround. Almost certainly is side. not. Yeah. I was going to say, and mine, it is like less than an inch. Indeed. I think, on that side. That's right. So he's worried about soundproofing overall. Uh, okay. What are our thoughts? Would backer boxes be enough? Um, yeah. So. If it were me mm -hmm. and I was in here and I, you know, I, the last thing I would want to do is cut holes in the ceiling. Indeed. Uh, especially if you're worried about s footfall sounds coming mm -hmm. through and sounds passing up through the ceiling into, I would sell all of these calves. You, uh, sure. the, the, the exterior wall almost certainly doesn't have enough space for you. It can, mm -hmm. but I mean, I would, you have to drill like a pilot hole first and like, mm -hmm kind of figure it out and i mean as bertrand uh, talked about like he's really happy he went on wall on ceiling yeah. rather than in um and i agree with that fully and there's certainly options to do that yeah so i would think that you can either go on wall or you know on shelf or mm -hmm. something else this is a not very not a huge space no. right and so therefore like the any sort of satellite speakers will be fine for your your mm -hmm. surrounds and and you could have matching all the way around if you really want to mm -hmm. so yeah i would not i would not so if you'd like to stop there he was worried about the house and the room the subwoofer questions are like they can wait so if you want to stop i'm fine to go on if you want to tom but we're all right uh no i i, I need to work <laughs> we've, we've reached past the two hour mark and we we got through the ones that were really important so yeah all rs right. i i wish we had better news like I know this sounds harsh. Uh, it's it's probably uh, you know ruining <laughs> some of the things that you want, but we don't we don't want to give you the advice, which is you spend all the money you do have, and probably a bit more if we're being honest, uh, and then you're like, but I I didn't get where I wanted or needed to be. That's what we're worried about. We would rather right. spend nothing and do nothing to the room. You know, going in at that point, that it's not going to be what you wanted, but at least you didn't like waste any money. Because right. if you got enough money, we can turn this room into a dedicated theater that you can blast, but it means gutting it and doing what you originally envisioned. So I'm going to say again, if there's, is there another room in your house yeah. that you can use? Is there a, is there a space that you can renovate in your house, mm. an attic that you can turn into a bonus room or a uh, space above your garage right. that you can turn into something else. I mean, especially if it's just rafters or just, mm. you know what I mean? If it's already open, then suddenly you have the option of doing all the soundproofing things from the get-go without mm. having to rip everything up and start again. Uh, you know, that is going to be your best bet, even if it's smaller than you expect it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, like Rob said, you know, you know, sound is like water. You know, it's the easiest way to just, visualize it. Yeah. yeah. If you if you took a, a a flat you know piece of paper and and uh, let's just say you took some paper and you built a box, you know, or uh, you know something like a ship, and then you coated the very bottom of it with uh, some sort of waterproof material, mm -hmm. and then put it in the water. The minute that that water touches the sides, mm -hmm. it's coming in. Mm -hmm. And that's if you turn that upside down, that's what putting green glue and <laughs> another layer of drywall on your ceiling is doing. Right. 
it, it when it hits the dry, the drywall and the green, green glue, yes, it will be reduced in volume mm-hmm. and you know it, everything will be better. But it's not the only way it can get mm-hmm. upstairs. I think the best thing that you can do in order to ensure that you're not going to get sound transmission upstairs any more than you actually have to is by getting rid of in ceiling and in wall speakers. Mm-hmm. I think that's going to be your number one thing that you can do because that will allow you to. Um, just you're just not cutting physical holes in your ceiling. Mm-hmm. You're not giving yet another flanking path. Uh, you know, I would even consider not running in wall in, in wall wires and just you know being careful with that. Though that's not as nearly as big of a deal as mm-hmm. some of the other things. So, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the the certainly the least expensive thing to change is your vision of the plan. <laughs> that's the yes. that's the least expensive thing. Because I mean look let's lower our expectations a little bit here. Lots <laughs> of our listeners have open plan, open floor plan setups, um, and are very happy with their experience in those. It's just it's not what you were thinking of, which is the fully dedicated, completely enclosed, I can blast this day or night room. In what you have right now, you could get there if you had all the money, but you're telling us a lot of that money has gone, and we suspected that was what was going to happen yeah, when you bought the yeah. house. So, uh, it's that's, not in this market. <laughs> yeah, that, that's unfortunately the thing that needs to tweak. You can have a nice, a very enjoyable experience in this room. I love Tom's idea. If you can find another room, that's even better. But if this is the only room where it's going to go, you can still have a very nice experience, but it isn't going to be the enclosed dedicated reference volume theater. you're gonna have to turn it down at night yeah. full stop all right who do we have left uh, well, i know we have ours just the rest of ours is that was it <laughs> oh that was it that okay. was it i want to thank our listeners of the week uh these are people that support the podcast and so we want to thank uh roth for going to avrent.com and clicking the buy us a cup of coffee link and leaving us a paypal donation as well as our 139 patrons over at patreon.com including bertrand yes indeed raf thank you so much for the paypal donation and a big thank you to our 139 patrons over at patreon.com slash avrant podcast where you can go to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation one day that money will actually get transferred to tom and then some of it will get transferred to me <laughs> that's how it works bertrand thanks for being one of our patrons that's right every time it passes through hands it gets smaller that's how that works we want to thank you for the Gary for talking us up to Rhythmic Audio, as well as the notes of gratitude from Alan, Dale, Bertrand, and Aris. Yes, indeed, Gary. Thanks very much for talking us up to Rhythmic Audio and Alan, Dale, Bertrand, Aris. Thank you for the notes of gratitude to us for keeping the podcast going through all this stuff, because yes, COVID is still here, very much so. People are still getting it, but uh, but Apparently. we are trucking along and doing all right. So thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. If you want your question answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Antry. And I'm Rob H. Now stay in and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.